in New York. And we're going to be having a discussion in this interview about the bishops in Canada, the United States, and other Western uh, nations uh, throughout the world. And I'd like to begin um, by taking an example and seeing if it uh, illustrates a broader point. And the example I'd like to talk about is the recent uh, Human Life International Conference that was held in Montreal, Quebec. Um, did you hear about what happened at this uh, conference, which happened, I think, a few months ago? Yes, I did, Bernard. I heard about that. I, in fact, I was supposed to speak at that, but health would not permit me to go. So I, b I, uh, I, I spoke to the assembly for about 20 minutes um, by phone. But I wasn't there, but uh, all my friends were there, and I've seen the video of it. And uh, the difficulty from the very beginning was that the moment HLI, Human Life International, proposed to have a, a, a meeting in Montreal uh, to protest against abortion and to vindicate the rights of the unborn, they knew immediately, speaking to the cardinal and speaking to his vicar general and speaking to the local authorities, that they were not welcome. Indeed, at one certain moment, it was very highly doubtful if they'd be allowed to use the Basilica for Mass. Uh, finally, they prevailed upon the Cardinal to allow them to use, the uh, use the Basilica uh, with closed doors, uh, but uh, it, it was a very cold and, uh, and uh, frigid welcome. Uh, besides that then, as you know, they were beset by a crowd of people uh, literally demonstrators, whom the police did not hinder at all, by the way. They had carte blanche to scream and shout, attack, uh, verbally and in one or two cases physically. Um, and uh, if you listen to this video, it's really like a horror film made for Halloween, where the devils are parading. But the point we're making here is that the reception by the bishop of Montreal, the cardinal, and his uh, entourage was dreadfully weak. They, the moment they heard any opposition to HLI, Human Life International, they proceeded to tell them they didn't want them there. They were unwelcome. For the purpose of our listeners, um, most of the individuals who were engaged in that uh, mob protest against uh, Human Life International were practicing homosexuals, and they were doing things like uh, hurling uh, glass and uh, shouting insults to our Lord and that kind of thing. Condoms I full of glass, and uh, I don't want to violate the ears of your listeners by telling them the things that were said and done by this crowd of very disgraceful people, uh, 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 both male and female but it was a disgraceful performance. But this struck fear into the hearts of the uh, clergy, uh, who would not have anything to do with them. Now, the point I'm making, and you're making it really, is this, that there is no courage there. There is no um, militancy. There is no support for the Catholic cause. They crumble immediately, and no wonder Canada is in trouble, uh, the Church in Canada is in trouble, uh, that abortion is uh, available, and that the, the clergy themselves are wishy-washy and the dogma is out the window and confessions and Holy Communion and the teaching of children uh, in schools where there's plenty of sex ed as we call it but very little instruction, real instruction why the church is being decatholicized in, in, in Canada and the people directly responsible for that are the bishops. Now in this particular case Cardinal Turcotte reacted to the protests of these uh, angry homosexuals by attacking uh, Human Life International. That's right. He said there were, uh, there were, there were, there were birds of, of contention. They were uh, just an apple of discord. Uh, why bother him about it all? He attacked them. And we know actually now that that entire protest against HLI was organized by the uh, Bene Brith, the Anti-Defamation League who evidently frightened Bishop Cardinal Turcotte sufficiently to tell him, to get him to refuse to help these people in any way, whatever. So it was a disgraceful uh, happening, but it illustrates the point we're making, uh, that the bishops today in the church uh, are weak, and many of them are not even Catholic in their belief. This is the terrible condition. Of things. So this um, example of what happened in Montreal happens elsewhere. It wasn't an isolated example. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. It happens all over the place. There is no support, really. Look, Bernard, here's the truth. 
we have between North America, in North America, between Canada and the U.S., we have a, a whole bench of bishops, over 250 residential bishops. And we have also auxiliary bishops. If all of them took to the streets tomorrow, plus the cardinals, there are about nine or ten cardinals in, the, in, the North, in North America, if they took to the streets on the question of abortion, we could stop this country and Canada until they modify their abortion laws. But they won't. Why? Because if you get to know our American bishops, anyway, I don't know the Canadian ones so well, but I know our Canadian bishops are not anti-abortion. They're not anti-abortion. Why is it that the bishops, let's say, in Canada and the United States aren't absolutely outraged by abortion, which is something that goes so entirely against uh, Catholic principles? Bernard, it's a question of faith. A lot of these people, not all of them, a lot of these bishops no longer are Catholic in their faith. They no longer believe. Let me give you an example. There's a thing here called the uh, Campaign for Human Development, the CHD. And they held uh, an annual gathering there this year, in the autumn, at which the present there were 40 bishops. 40 bishops. And at that they had, a, they had a, a, an extraordinary mass with dancers and leotards and with uh, singing and uh, songs and music that had nothing to do with the church at all. They had a huge long table uh, containing goblets of wine. And when they had, so to speak, consecrated, because we don't believe they really consecrated the wine, the guests went over and they quaffed the wine and chatted as if they were at a cocktail party. Now, don't tell me anybody there really believed this was the blood of our Lord Jesus. And they believed the bread had, been, had become his That they would drink this wine just as if it was... Uh... As if it was wine. As if it was just wine or cocktail. There, there was no semblance of reverence at all. And I, I cannot believe that they, the bishops present, there are all 40 of them, and we can call out their names, uh, but I don't want to bring the blush of shame to their Episcopal faces. Uh, they, they couldn't have believed that that wine had become the, body, the blood of our Lord Jesus and the bread had become his body. They couldn't. They couldn't do that. If they really believed it was his majesty, it was his power, his omnipotence of the Son of God who died on a cross and who reigns in heaven and is going to judge the living and the dead. No, they couldn't do it. So the point I'm making is that many bishops no longer are Catholic in their faith. They no longer are. And we have to face that fact that they now are in a peculiar transitional condition and we are dragged with them. And that's why they're suppressing churches and uh, maintaining homosexuals and not cleaning out seminaries with their heretical, heretical teachers. This is the condition of the church, the bishops. And what has happened is that's what we must discuss today. Now, here's another question I have. Um, there was a situation in... Boston, where uh, Cardinal Law basically suppressed um, protests by Catholics at uh, abortion clinics. That's right. That's right. Yet, uh, I remember when Cardinal Law was appointed, it was said that he was the Pope's uh, right-hand man, that he was a conservative and that kind of thing. And I've seen this situation happen many, many times when men are appointed over a bishop. They're said that they're conservative, they're going to clean house and then nothing happens. No. What's Why? That? Because from the very beginning they lacked faith. They lacked faith. They're not put in because they're believers. They're put in because they have friends in Rome. But these people are um, have reputations of being conservative. That's merely what it is. Merely a reputation. Law is not conservative at all. I mean, remember that it was under him that Ted Kennedy got an annulment for his marriage. And uh, uh, that form of annulment uh, is for us is just another excuse for divorce. Now, Bernard Law is not a conservative. Bernard Law has only one interest in life, and that's Bernard Law and his advancement. And he hopes to rise higher than Cardinal. He considers himself papabile, to be papable. But he's not a conservative in any sense of the word that's worthy of the Christian and Catholic tradition. So... It, it, Bernard, we have to go back before they become cardinals, before they become bishops. They start off having lost their faith or never having had it, perhaps. I do not know. Each individual case is different. But we have a set of bishops now who do contain some saints. There's no doubt about that. I can think of two or three 
in the American bishops, by the way, among them, who I'm a, whom I would consider good bishops, and one of them certainly is saintly. But the majority? No, I couldn't guarantee the faith of the majority of these people. Otherwise, they would not behave as they're behaving. They couldn't behave as they're behaving. Now, what has happened? Because these men, um, primarily our uh, older men now, mm -hmm. having uh, risen to the rank that they have, they probably were trained in good seminaries, let's say in the 1950s or earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened? Didn't they have the faith at that time? I don't, I don't think so. I don't think you lose your faith as easily as all that. There was a loss of faith way back somewhere, and uh, their access to high office only confirmed their loss of faith. Besides that, as you know, the Vatican Council, the Vatican Council II, issued a document called Lumen Gentium, the light of the Gentiles, and it concerns the constitution of the Church. What is the Church? It answers that question. And um, it made a huge change and let me give you a picture. All right. It is November 1964. And uh, there's going to be a big vote the following day in the council. And that vote is to state that the bishops of the church share the same jurisdiction and authority as the pope over the universal church as well as over their particular dioceses. That's the vote. And it's an important vote. An aide to the Pope, who now is a bishop, Bishop McGee, not then a bishop, but working at the council, went down to a conference room that had been used by the Periti, the theologians, because he had left either his breviary or a comb or something down there, he wanted to pick it up again. And he scuffed on the ground, he scuffed two or three sheets of paper. And he picked them up just out of interest, and he found that they were in the handwriting of a very well-known Periti, Peritus, theologian, theologian, a German, an Austrian actually, and that they outlined the strategy by which the bishops were going to take the jurisdiction of the Pope over for themselves, in virtue of this vote. So he would dashed up to Paul VI, it was late at night, Paul VI, typically, Hamlet, said, well I can't stop the vote now, and the vote is majority for this a strange doctrine they have, but I'll write a special note, a nota explicativa, an explanatory note. Now the vote took place, and the vote, the, the, the document was approved, and the document states that the bishops share in the universal jurisdiction and power of the Pope over the Church Universal as well as over their dioceses, and that puts the bishops on a par with the Pope. Is this what is sometimes referred to as the principle of collegiality? That's right. That's right. That's right. And does this principle have any precedent in church history? None. None. There is no college of bishops in the church tradition. There's a college of cardinals, and it is, even, it is not even apostolic, but there's that tradition. There's no college of bishops. The relationship of bishops to the pope is one-on-one, -on -one, individual to individual. But this was introduced deliberately because if the pope becomes just a bishop, Merely. And he, he, whatever power he has is shared by everybody else. You can see what happens. Well, we know what happened, Bernard, because since then, the big change has taken place in the Church. You know, before Vatican Council, you could, if you wanted to have an image of the Church, uh, it was this, a central hub with pipes going out to the various provinces of the Church throughout the world, north, south, east, and west. And those pipes conveyed instruction and uh, uh, admonition and advice, and they, 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 they brought to Rome zeal and obedience and acquiescence and questions and queries, etc. But that was the center. There was only one hub, and Rome was the center. Now, every diocese is a hub all by itself. And the bishops, it's easier for the Pope to remove a parish priest than it is to move a bishop nowadays, because the bishop is now part of, they founded then regional and national conferences of bishops, and the National Conference of Catholic Bishops in the United States, the NCCB, and it's a, it has a political arm called the USCC, the United States Catholic Conference, they're totally independent of the Pope and they make their own laws. They decided to have communion in the hand, they decided to have altar girls, they've decided to have ordained female deaconesses to have deaconesses ordained and they're going to have them too whether we like it or not and you're going to have them in Canada so the bishops have seized the reins they now say that uh, they are they are the uh, they are they have the same power as the Pope over the Church Universal 
So, this document was passed. Paul VI wrote this explanatory note uh, and said this must be added to the document. It's never added to the main text of the document, it's put at the back, and nobody ever refers to it ever again. Nobody ever refers to the nota explicativa. And the result is that everybody says, well, the Vatican Council too, it decided the bishops were the equal of the Pope. And they can decide for the universal church and make decisions. They haven't got to ask the Pope about things any longer. And indeed, they don't. They well, then, in this situation, you have something similar, let's say, to the Church of England, this one. where the Archbishop of Canterbury is only the first among equals, and, and he has no real authority outside his none, own diocese. None, and he hasn't got any. Or like this is the Archbishop of Constantinople, the Patriarch of Constantinople, the same thing. And it's reducing. It's a Protestant idea. By the way, it was a heresy. It was called Gallicanism. And it was condemned more than once, and it was condemned at the Vatican Council, the uh, First Vatican Council. But they got it through this time. And the difficulty is that uh, now that is the mode today. And the bishops are know they're independent, and they, they say the Vatican Council has made them independent. Yes, they venerate the Pope because that's the most ancient sea, and it's the Sea of Peter, and that sort of uh, thing. But they, they have lost all reverence and respect and obedience. Now, that's the difficulty with the bishops today. The result is that we are now faced with the fact that every diocese is a little fiefdom in itself, and every bishop considers himself to be totally independent, and therefore his clergy do. And uh, we see this again and again in the United States. It's, it's rampant. Uh, everybody, there's a, there's a, fellow, a priest called Father Di Nardo in the, in the Pittsburgh diocese, who is supposed to be a theologian. And he gave an interview lately in which he said that uh, just don't listen to the Pope, just listen to the bishop. He's the, the, he's the man who has all the authority. And that is the belief today. And so the, the, the power and the prestige and the authority of Peter, the Pope, has been diminished to nothing. To nothing. That's the main difficulty we have today with uh, when we're the normal Catholics in the normal diocese that we are now at the mercy of a local bishop who has cut himself off from Rome and regards himself as equal in authority, in fact superior. He can make decisions for his diocese, and if Rome says, don't do it, he can cock a snook at that. He can say, no, we're going to do it anyway, and they do. That's the difficulty. Now, what I'd like to do um, now is move into um, an article mm -hmm. that was published in the Catholic Family News, which you authored, called The Judas Complex. Uh -huh. And I'd like you to explain exactly what this Judas Complex is and how that might relate to uh, our bishops. Well, now, you read that. What, was the, uh, what message did I convey to you, the essential message I conveyed to you about the Judas, com about the Judas Complex? What was the essential message you got? What I I'd love to know from somebody else except myself. What I understood is that Judas did not have an outright rebellion against our Lord. He just figured that he had a better way of uh, putting the Christian message across. That's right. That's he knew better than that, the Master. That's the essence of it. That was the essence of the Judas complex. Judas was not a bad man in that sense. He, as you say, uh, he, it was quite clear from the Gospels, he didn't want our Lord dead. He didn't want him killed. He wanted our Lord to be king of the Jews and he'd be one of the ministers. But he thought the best way to do that would be to curry favor with the sectarian, uh, secular authorities in Jerusalem. That was his whole point. And he was trying to be the big go-between uh, between our Lord and the authorities so that he would introduce him to the temple and he, Judas, would be the prime minister in the new state, would be the, the chief cook and bottle washer under our Lord. That was the Judas complex. Now, the parallel with our bishops today is tremendous in that. And that's why there is a Judas complex abroad. And it is this. There's no doubt about it that the inability or the refusal, put it like that, of the American bishops to really tackle abortion, really tackle pornography, really, atta really tackle homosexuality, public homosexuality, pedophilia, um, the refusal of the American bishops and the Canadian bishops, is because they don't want to lose their friendships with the secular governments. They want to be well-behaved citizens. They want to conform to the liberal tradition, which is now rampant both in America, uh, in the USA, and in Canada. So they think they know better 
how to do this rather than stand up and be counted and to say no abortion is wrong no we will fight this we fight it in the streets we fight it in the legislature we fight it in our schools they, they don't do that they have decided they know better than the doctrine of the church which says abortion is wrong and homosexuality is wrong and sex ed is wrong it's bad for the children so part of the problem is that they want to be accepted by the world rather than follow the tradition of being a sign of contradiction that's right that's right they they don't want they don't want that at all the difficulty is this that they again go back to the vatican council where it is said that the church is there to help man to build his human habitat to build a life on earth full of prosperity that is totally new that's a totally secular concept totally the, if you look at the prayers of the mass prayers of all the saints, the prayers of all the masses up to 1965, it always says, Lord, teach us to despise the things of this world and to seek the celestial things, heavenly things. There's no message at all that we're supposed to build the human paradise, but that is the message today of Vatican Council, and that's what the bishops have taken as their, their ideal. So therefore, you can limit families. Uh, and uh, you can practice contraception because they don't really inveigh against contraception it's nowadays you've got to limit the population so they are go along with that because that's what the popular mind says and isn't that then another parallel to the Judas complex because Judas was thinking of a kingdom in an earthly sense not a heavenly sense no no he's thinking of an earthly kingdom all the apostles were by the way they hadn't been enlightened yet and even after the resurrection the apostles said to our Lord Jesus Lord are you going to in these days restore the kingdom of Israel and he our Lord even gave a very evasive answer he said it's not for you to know these things my father will reveal it all when the Holy Spirit comes to you he didn't he knew they wouldn't understand Judas didn't understand at all and he thought that he could be the man to make this go between situation to make the compromise and therefore that uh, everybody would benefit and they could build a human habitat in Jerusalem a new Israel conquest conquering all peoples and, and being prime amongst the nations as they've been promised in Holy Scripture as far as he read it. yes that was the Judas complex and it is alive and well today and if you if you know find any cleric any bishop any cardinal any pope carrying favor and not standing up and being counted not professing them the doctrine of Jesus he's he's acting out the Judas complex and now I'm afraid we're doing that over all the over all the whole lot because we're going along with mostly what the, what the secular powers ask us to do and that's the difficulty then the people feel abandoned they have no leader leadership any longer and the bishop says it's quite all right for instance take Ireland Holy Ireland the island of saints and scholars the country where I was born now they're going to have a referendum on abortion and uh, on divorce and the bishop's attitude is to tell the people do what you choose well choose they're not even telling them they must vote against abortion they're not telling them they must vote against contraception they're not telling them they must vote that they're saying be free that that's not Catholic tradition you tell them it is wrong to abort it is wrong to support abortion it is wrong to put people into office who support abortion but what bishop does that here? John O'Connor doesn't do it. In the Maoch dies us here. Cardinal O'Connor doesn't tell people. Bernard Law does not condemn them. By the way, uh, Cardinal uh, O'Connor is another example of one of these uh, conservatives who has turned out to be somewhat of a disappointment. That's right, he has. Well, he's gone along with the, he, the Judas complex again. He, he does not want to fall out. He want, likes to be popular. They all like to be popular. Once you're engaged in that popularity context, you're not going to stand up for the Lord Jesus and for the principles of the church. And they haven't, and therefore they don't condemn politicians who are bad Catholics, who are members of the Masonic Lodge, who promote abortion and abortion funding, and who see nothing wrong with homosexuality. They, they don't condemn, they should be condemned in public. They are public sinners. So I think now, um, with, let's say, tools such as the Judas uh, Complex and... Um, other analyses of the bishops were starting to get a, a better understanding of uh, their behavior because it's very confusing to the laity to see them behave this it way is, it is. and we can also understand let's say their reaction to the pro-life movement or let's say to um, your staunch uh, traditionalists that they would might regard um, these people as an embarrassment because they're blocking kind of uh, their acceptance by the world 
That's right. They find them very, very embarrassing. And uh, when, when recently, or during this last, I think it was this year, 95, one of the, one of the anti-abortion people killed a doctor, down south, I think it was. Um, Cardinal Law, for instance, uh, asked them to ask the uh, rescuers and the protesters the peaceful protesters who protested outside of abortions and uh, dissuaded mothers from going in and having abortions, he asked them to stop for a while, to lay off all activity, uh, which of course is cowardice. And it was an acknowledgement that, in his mind, they were responsible for the murder of this doctor, this abortion abortionist who was killed, shot dead uh, by this uh, zealot uh, who is now condemned to prison. Uh, for life, as far as I know, that's the sentence he got. But they, 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 uh, they, they find it very embarrassing, and uh, there now we know that the Justice Department and the judiciary have got their own instructions privately to make it impossible for these people to live, to put them in prison, keep them in prison unjustly, uh, don't give them bail, give them impossible sentences, give them impossible fines, beggar them. Drive them, drive them out, drive them out. And the police say, I, I happen to know, this is the police in Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, they were given special instructions. They could hurt and break wrists and break ankles, and nobody would be, would be the slightest bit of protest. And when young women, old women, and young women are taken prisoner by the police, they're strip searched by men in the prisons. And there's no recourse, whatever. And yet the bishops say nothing. Of course they don't because they don't want to get into a hassle with the local police or the local judiciary. They go to dinner, they eat with them, they, they, they go to the same spas, they, they share the same banks. They, they, and then, chiefly, faith. Faith is lacking. But it's a question of belief and faith. If you believe that a baby is a, a real baby and not a blob, you're going to protest. And you're going to tell people, no, I'm sorry, I can't go along with it. But they don't believe that any longer. And they are very embarrassed, and and uh, they don't want to have anything to do with these public uh, protests. They, they, this is very embarrassing. And they, when they go into the club, or they go to a spa, or they have uh, a special dinner, they don't want to be confronted by these people who are very indignant about being accused of being murderers and being accused of uh, indecent human behavior by killing babies. Uh, and we have at the present moment the, the partial the partial abortion partial abortion question. Do you know what this is? No, I don't. Well, it's the present moment. They have a new system now with a baby who's late. They take the baby half out and they pierce the nape of its neck and suck its brains out and the head collapses. And the birth is very easy. And then they harvest the body for, for the organs. And they had a vote in the Senate, in the House, which condemned this and made it uh, unlawful to do it. And the Senate refused. So now it's going back to committee again. And the fact is that now it's clear. You take a baby, a fully formed baby, halfway out of the womb, but its head is still inside, and you, you suck its brains out and collapse its skull, and then take it out. You kill a baby. So, I mean, this is... But there's no vast protest by the bishops about this. There's no, there's no street protest. There's nobody outside the White House. There's nobody picketing the Senate. There, there, there's, there's no protest. I think that the laity are starting to pick up on this, because... Let's say amongst the laity, there's all kinds of, let's say, jokes circulating, such as, like, uh, that before a bishop is uh, consecrated, they remove his spine and that kind that's of right, thing. That's right. There are a lot of jokes about that. No, they, they, they have lost respect. They, they, they no longer have respect for the bishops as such. I, I know very few people. There are a few bishops that are respected, but there are people who stand up, and they're, they're always in obscure dioceses stuck away in South Dakota or someplace like that, or down south in Louisiana. They have no prominence at all, and they're shunned by the other bishops. They get no power at all in the conference of bishops, and they're constantly hindered by their fellow bishops themselves. They, they don't get on the powerful committees. They don't go to Rome for special things. They're not called on for special favors. They are neglected because they're an embarrassment, too. They actually are speaking about our Lord Jesus' law. So it's a pretty bad uh, situation. The people themselves no longer respect the bishops, and they no longer know them as their defenders and their instructors, and the people who are giving them the truth of our Lord's revelation. So it's, a, it's, it's all weakened the church to the point that a bishop, who cares about a bishop? You, this is a phrase you constantly hear. Who cares about a bishop? Now you've mentioned a paradox here. The bishops are trying to win the favor of the world, 
And yet now, you say, you say that they've lost respect. This would seem to indicate then that uh, this strategy of trying to win favor with the world isn't working. Is that the case? That is the case. It isn't working because all that's happening is they're becoming tools of the world. That's all. Uh, they're, they're useful. Uh, you see, what we fail to realize is this, Bernard. The enemies of the church don't want to destroy the church structure. They want to use it because they know that religion is a stabilizing factor in life. You must have some religious and moral beliefs, otherwise there's chaos, and it's the jungle. So they insist that the church be there and observe the laws, and but conform to their worldliness. And therefore, if they can get the bishops to be loyal servants of the state, which we are now, but they have now become loyal servants of the state. When once the majority of the judiciary decide abortion is good, once they decide that homosexual marriages are acceptable, then the bishops must agree. That's their, the attitude of the secular mind. And the attitude of the bishops is, well, we can't do anything about it. We'll have to go along with it and respect the law, instead of protesting forever, refusing to accept it, standing out saying, no, we won't accept this at all. We will, we'll be in perpetual rebellion against it. And not merely in words, in actions, we'll protest. And we'll condemn the lawgivers who do this. And we'll form Catholics who will refuse to vote for you, and refuse to vote money for you and refuse to... But we don't do that. There is no militancy at all. There is no, there is no attempt to counteract the secularism that is invading the bishops. This attitude of the secular authorities is very interesting because I remember reading um, that Hitler uh, said privately that he wanted to keep the church around because it was a conservative force within society. It's a stabilizing force. It is a very stabilizing force. They always, people never want to get rid of it. Uh, even Castro didn't get rid of the church, but he did control it. And Stalin found out that he needed the church to keep the Russian people behind him. And he did the same thing. He dominated completely. Uh, the, major, the major members of the Russian Orthodox Church were members of the KGB, and still are of the new KGB, because it's always needed. Similarly in the United States, the, the, the liaison uh, between the White House and the Senate and the Congress and the bishops is a very tight liaison. And they're not going to fall out with them because they want favors. So the strategy here is to use the church, not snuff it out. Oh no, not snuff it out, but make it obedient. And for instance, in the matter of school, of education, schools. In principle, we say we claim the right and the obligation to educate the child. We must have the child for education. We will not. Uh, let the, anybody take the child. This is the Catholic principle. But de facto, we have allowed through our so-called Catholic schools, and longer Catholic, the state to dictate the curricula and decide uh, the psychological training of these children. We, 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 we have given in on this point because the state is now all dominant. And uh, it's going to... Bernard, there is a time coming in this country and in Canada when a subtle persecution is going to start. Uh, through taxation and through civil liabilities, as they call it. And it's going to become impossible for a practicing Catholic, for a practicing bishop, a real Catholic bishop, to function any longer. They'll be hemmed in by taxation laws. We will have the IRS down on our backs. We will have uh, principles about... Ch uh, we'll have laws affecting children going to school and what they must do and what they must do in order to get a high school diploma, which we have already. You must do national service, and you must submit to their, uh, the lectures they give on civic behavior. That's all taken away from that. We're not protesting. We've given up two generations already of children to state curricula in the schools. So we've lost the children of North America, of Canada and the USA, because the bishops simply want to go along, to get along. So it's, it's, it's an abandonment of their principle. But again, I point out to you and uh, to our listeners, this is only because they've lost faith. You, you wouldn't do that if you really believed in the revelation of our Lord and in the Church and the power of the Church and the obligation of the Church to educate the child itself. You wouldn't do that. And uh, you wouldn't approve of homosexual marriages or allow it. 
you protest against it if you really believed in the sacrament of marriage. But they don't any longer. The, but let, let me give you one, one or two minutes on my pet peeve today. And it's this. The good people who are still believers, the good bishops who are still believers, there are those, the good theologians who are still believers, the good nuns who are still believers, wake up. Something has been irrevocably lost. And that is the Catholic faith structure as an organization. It doesn't exist any longer. It used to exist. It was snuffed out. Sometime between 1965 and 1995, it was strangled. It doesn't exist any longer. And the best I know, the best theologians I know today in Rome and throughout the world are beginning to say, what has happened? Nothing works. There is no evangelization. There is no vast movement of the church. When the Pope speaks about the vibrancy of the modern church, we don't know what he's talking about. And when the bishops say that everything is going well and the church is really surviving and its quality is today, not quantity, we, 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 we know it's all garbage. We, we, this is what these people are saying. And there are, I read them, the articles in, in foreign newspapers and in foreign magazines and in our own in the United States and in Canada. And they're, all, they're all saying the same thing. But very few will edge around and face the horrible reality that we now have the unfaith of bishops the Judas complex of bishops who no longer believe. They don't believe any longer. And we therefore we no longer have this faith structure as a social entity. It doesn't exist any longer. What well, was very interesting is that this revolutionary change, let's say in mm. church structure mm. and in attitude, the loss of faith and uh, juridically, let's say, this shift away from a hierarchy to the principle of That's collegiality right. has all happened without people really even realizing it. No, we've been led by the nose. And some of the appearances seem to have been kept. Sure. Oh, then there, there is the, the panoply is still there, and the orders, and the bishops, and, and the priests, and the parish priests, and, and the diocese. That, that, that is all there. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the, the faith in all that. The, the faith is no longer there. The, these are no longer Catholics. And most of these people have been led out of the church by the nose. They don't know it. Uh, and some of the best are beginning to say, wait a moment, there's something not going. Something is not working somewhere. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark, as Shakespeare has uh, in Hamlet. Uh, there's the, the, something has failed completely, and all our efforts are going nowhere. All the vast uh, meetings and conventions, international gettings together, and, and the evangelization groups, the meetings in Latin America with the Pope, and the meetings in North America, the meetings in Europe, uh, nothing happens. There's no improvement. There's no improvement in mass. There's no improvement in baptism. There's no improvement in vocations to the priesthood. There's no improvement in morality. On the contrary, more and more Catholics are lapsing into contraception and abortion and getting divorced and think homosexuality is fine, uh, uh, you know, they, and don't go, to, don't go to the church any longer, they aren't even baptized, and their children are not educated, they don't teach the prayers. There's complete uh, absence of Catholicism. The, my, my pet peeve today is that the best, the really good middle-of-the-road conservatives refuse to admit the disaster. Because if they did, they'd be up on their hind legs. They wouldn't be sitting in their armchairs. They wouldn't be accepting the way the bishops act. They, and the bishop wouldn't be accepting the way the Roman, the, the Roman authorities act. And the, priest, the people wouldn't be accepting what the priests, uh, the priests act. The people, the laity, are the only people protesting. They know there's something wrong. They're protesting. They're protesting. But what can they do? They have no canonical power. But that's my pet grumble today. That they, they, uh, I could name. There's not really a full realization of what has happened. They won't admit it, Bernard. It's terribly hard to admit that a good, solid block of bishops, say in the United States, no longer believe. If you admit that, if you admit, for instance, that we know of certain cases where ordinations are invalid, the priests are not priests. Therefore, there's no blessed sacrament, there's no confession. If you begin to admit these things and realize the damage done and the, the complete failure of Catholicism, you get desperate. You get desperate. And people sometimes go off uh, half-cocked when that happens. They, they join various sects and they, 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 get, they, they get desperate. And that's not, that's not wise either. But first of all, we acknowledge, we acknowledge that there's something wrong that something is not going, that the faith is dying out, or has died out, and that we are led by people who don't believe. Because how do you know that? Because they couldn't act the way they're acting if they believed. They couldn't act like that.
They're just good. Now, I'd like to move on here and discuss how this has affected the priests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you have, like, seemingly many changes uh, going on at the parish level in terms of structure. For example, and maybe you can uh, add something here, I know of parishes where the priest power uh, has been very much diminished. They appoint these uh, liberal ex-nuns to be parish administrators, and the priest hardly has any say in what goes on in the parish. Yes, and you see, Bernard, if that was an isolated case, if there was one case of that in Seattle, say, and one case in Florida, and one case, say, in Calgary, Canada, or, you know, or in Nova Scotia, we say, okay, they're always funny, they're always aberrants and aberrancies in the human situation. But today, you can, on a map, you can trace a pattern. And it's obvious that, by the way, in America, the, in the USA, there are about 19,200 parishes, about that. Almost 20,000, but 19,000. If you go over each of those parishes in each of the states, there's a pattern. You can see that what's happening is that uh, vocations are not pushed, and therefore there are no priests. And therefore they've got to put a cluster of parishes together because they lack priests. And on, in charge of that, they put usually a, a, a woman, a nun, an ex-nun. Anyway, she's a female administrator. And she has the power. She decides who says Mass, or who says what, who does what. She decides baptism, she decides the books used, she decides the subject of sermons, she decides if a sermon is wrong, if the subject is the wrong sermon, or if a sermon is badly preached. She, she admonishes the priest in question, who is now a presider or a minister. And priests avoid, they, they avoid the word priest. But you find there's a pattern of this beginning. And it's now, if you see, see if you suddenly see a pattern set up, and appearing everywhere. Somebody, this is intelligence. Some intelligence is doing this. This is not by accident. This is deliberate. So there's a pattern. What is the pattern? The pattern is this. It is eliminating priesthood. That's number one. Priesthood has been diminished to what? To what? He's in charge of the plant, and he, he puts on these vestments and uh, goes in for this ceremony called the Novus Ordo, uh, and, uh, and he has other functions. He presides over committees and he preaches a sermon now and again. But doesn't that undermine the whole hierarchical and sacramental nature of the church? That's the idea. So that's they want this. Of course, that's what I'm saying. It's a pattern of the Satanist mind, because this is the Luciferian or Satanist plan for the church, to secularize everything, get rid of, de-priest the church, de-Romanize the church, de-Catholicize the church, and have it as a social... Uh, factor, a stabilizing factor in the socio-cultural um, facade of the USA and of Canada and of the world. That's the idea. But make it conform to that. And if you can break the priesthood, get rid of it, and uh, diminish the priest to the no importance at all, which they're doing, and this pattern makes that obvious. If you plot it out on a map, you'll see what's happening. Then you know that we have the Judas complex right within the church, planning exactly the destruction of the church. And that's, that's the whole aim of it. And you know, the, what we should look is there are sections of France, Bernard, and you can drive for hundreds of miles and you never see a church. There isn't even a ruined church. There's no convent. There's no parish priest. There's no parish church. There's nothing. And the majority of the people, if you ask them this, you know, they knew something that's incroyant. We, we don't believe it. We, we, we're at there. We, we don't believe it. This is Catholic France. And that's what's happening in this country, too. The whole sections. This explains a lot, because now I'm beginning to understand why the bishops don't seem to be that disappointed by the fact that there are so few vocations. No, they're not disappointed at all by that. Why should they be disappointed? Because they don't believe in it. A majority of them do not believe any longer that it's important to have priests. That's why they like altar girls. That's why they like the idea of female administrators and Eucharistic ministers. Take the Eucharistic ministers, for instance. The law propagated by Rome was you have Eucharistic ministers when you have no priests. Well, take my parish church where I used to go to Mass in Dublin, in Holy Dublin, Holy Ireland. It's a huge uh, parish called St. Agatha's Parish, and it's full of Catholics and full of... There has five priests. It has 37 Eucharistic ministers, all women. And it's against the law. It's illegal. But it's still... That's the way it is every place. There should be no Eucharistic ministers unless they're absolutely necessary and there are no priests at all available. 
So they, 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 the, the thing is to de-priest, de-Catholicize, de-sacralize the church. Because all that's voodoo stuff, all that is superstition, all that is the old church, which nobody wants nowadays. This is what they say. So that's what's happening. And that's why the priests themselves are diminished in stature completely. And the bishops, the bishops are not interested in that. They're not interested in, in having a plethora of vocations. The, the normal bishops. There are bishops who are. There are very good bishops. Uh, we have four or five in the United States certainly who are very, very good in this matter of vocations and seminary training. But that's four or five out of 180. And uh, consequently we are, we are no longer getting vocations. And then we have the plague of homosexuality uh, in the seminaries. And they're not wiping that out, because some of them are homosexuals anyway. They don't see what's wrong with it, except of uh, ancient fuddy-duddy superstition of the Church against homosexuality, instead of being modern-minded. This is the attitude they have to it. So, uh, all told, the, the, the status of the priest is reduced, <clears throat> very much reduced. Now, I do know some very good priests um, who are resisting this kind of thing. Sure. But I know of a case, and perhaps you can tell me whether this is just an isolated example or whether it's happening all across uh, America and Canada. Um, I know a priest who is a very good priest, um, and some people from the parish went to the bishop mm. to try to get him out, because it seems like in every parish there is this group of uh, modernists. The bishop went along with these uh, people and told him to see a psychiatrist. Is this happening all across America? Oh, yes. We have two institutes in the United States. Uh, and I, I, I was just dealing in, I can't mention any names in this matter, but there's a, a Midwest diocese where this young priest called me up and he said that his bishop called him in. And the bishop has a great reputation, by the way. And the bishop said to him, look, you, you, you don't make, you don't fit in. You, you don't fit in very well. You, you're not hail fellow well met. People find you too stiff. And you, your sermons are very harsh. You speak about abortion and, and uh, contraception and homosexuality and things like that. And you, you, you threaten them. You menace them. You make them unhappy. And uh, I want to suggest that you go away to a certain institute and uh, be, uh, undergo a psychosexual assessment. And, uh, of course, we, the, this priest rang me and several others and canon lawyers. And they said, look, he's going to turn you into a zombie. Because that's what they do. Uh, you go in there to these two institutes, they're both in, in, in the East Coast, and one is down south, and you have a, it's a psychopharmacological treatment. They give you drugs and calm you down, and they talk about your sexual life and ask you uh, whether you're homosexual or heterosexual, and they, they, you come out of it completely drained. You come out a zombie, a real zombie, if you go there. And, um, this is so common nowadays. I have 42 priests that I know personally, some of them I'm supporting, who refused. Who refused. What were their offenses? Well, they promoted the Blessed Sacrament. They had devotion to Padre Pio. They used to use novenas. They preached about the Passion. They preached against homosexuality. They preached against contraception. Uh, and they preached against annulments and divorces. And the bishop called him in and said, what is this? One of them was called in because he uses Latin in the Pope. He used a Latin tag or a Latin phrase. And the bishop, a very well-known bishop, archbishop in the East Coast, called him in and said, what's this, what's this use of Latin? We, Latin has died out. We don't use Latin in the pulpit any longer. The people don't understand it. You don't even use a phrase of Latin. There's this peculiar attitude. They're, 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 they're making the priest conform to a certain model of uh, social... He's a social worker. He's supposed to keep people happy and be the manager of the plant and manage the money and, uh, and in general, make people feel that they're at home. And uh, there was one young priest objected to young girls coming to the choir with uh, hot, hot pants on them. If you know what a hot pants is, it's a very short pants or short dresses. And he was sent away to a psychosexual analysis. Now, I find this whole phenomena very, very scary because... There's a parallel here with the Soviet Union where uh, the communists would send its political and religious dissidents um, to these kinds of uh, institutions for psychiatry. Absolutely, absolutely. And, but now that we're on the point, 
I want to adduce one case, and one case only, because now it's becoming national, uh, nationally famous. This is Father Anthony Cipolla, Pittsburgh Diocese, who was accused unjustly, as we found out, by a well-known homosexual of having had homosexual relations with him. The man, same man, young man also accused the Bishop of Pittsburgh, Donald, uh, uh, Bishop, Archbishop Donald World, known to his friends as Donna World, by the way, um, he also accused him. Cipolla uh, got a lawyer. The case went before a trial. He was exonerated completely. And yet his bishop, Archbishop, uh, Cip uh, Archbishop World, insists he go for a psychosexual analysis. Now, uh, Father Cipolla went for one analysis, and he was completely exonerated and completely cleared up. They said, this man is neither homosexual nor a lecher. He's a good priest who's been accused. These were psychologists who analyzed him. But no, um, uh, Archbishop World wants to break this man in two and to insist that he go to a, a certain s psychosexual uh, analysis center and become a zombie. And this man has refused. And uh, everywhere this priest goes, the Archbishop of Pittsburgh writes letters warning everybody not to touch him, not to give him any work, and his persecution. And uh, finally, the man appealed to Rome, to the Segnatura. The Segnatura ruled in his favor in the beginning. Then the Archbishop went over to Rome and spoke to some people there. We think he corrupted them. We don't know. Everything is wide open. And the result is the Segnatura turned against this priest. So now we're going back to another round of terms. This is going on for seven years now. And it's cost the young priest every bit of money he had. And he's living from hand to mouth. Father Cipolla. But this is a very important point. Because it shows, then, that one can't necessarily believe what you read in the newspapers about certain priests being accused of this or of that. No, no, not until the thing has gone to the court, gone to law. Uh, and uh, it is used now to destroy people, uh, as it's used to destroy... And ruin their reputations. Kill them. Once a priest gets a reputation like that, he never recovers. He never recovers. I mean, you know, the point is, that, okay, so you take back the accusation, but now give me back my reputation. <laughs> you can't do it. That's the, uh, the constant cry of people who have been calumniated and slandered. And Archbishop Well has to answer to God for the persecution he's carried out of this one man, Cipolla. He has really persecuted him. But it's the classic example. It's now, by the way, public. It's published in the newspaper. Uh, and uh, there's a longer story being going to be published next month by the Wanderer, giving the whole details of the situation. But it is the typical case of the young priest. The bishop wants to change and insists that he go and be treated psychologically. It's not a spiritual thing. It's not a question of ascetical theology. It's not a question of a retreat to meditate upon the last things and our Lord's revelation. No, no. This is pure psychology. Just psychology itself and psychiatry. And this is a plague. And of course, the point is that a bishop who does that, he is no longer a believer. As far as I'm concerned, Bernard, he has lost the faith himself. He's relying on human means. And also, he's jealous of the priest, or what? We don't know why he persecutes this priest. We don't know why they do persecute priests like that, but they do. They do. They get frightened that they're going back to the old church, they're going to revert back to pre-Vatican II behavior, as if that was a mortal sin. Let's, Let's stop here. What is the attitude of the bishops towards the uh, traditional Latin Mass? Abominable. Abominable. They were told by the Pope uh, that they should be very indulgent to those who still cling to the traditional uh, mode of saying Mass, the Roman Mass, as I call it, but they have not listened to that. And there are, I suppose, in the 19,000 or 20,000 parishes in the United States every week, there's uh, a traditional Mass allowed in about what? Oh, say, about 200 parishes. Barely 200. And they're trying to suppress it. I'm in contact with a lot of the people who have organized these masses, mm -hmm. and it seems like the whole structure is always trying to uh, make their lives difficult. Always, always. They, they try to wear them down through attrition. That's right. They try to kill them off. And they, they, make, they put the mass in an impossible place at an impossible time, and they, they appoint an old, old priest who can't talk properly to say the mass and who's slow, and sometimes it, the effort dies out. No, they want to kill the mass, and they go crazy once you introduce the mass. And I'm Bernard, I'm a priest. If I go up to the local parish church in Bermuda shorts and a t-shirt with a parrot on my shoulder and I start saying mass, saying mass, a new mass, I'm delighted. They say it's innovative. 
if I grew up dressed in the old vestments of the Roman Church and start off in Truibo at Altari Day and proceed to say Latin Mass, they'll call the police and get me ejected. They're that fanatic about not admitting the Mass. And deep down, deep down, it's Lucifer's own hate for Calvary. Because the Mass is Calvary. It's not a reenactment of Calvary. It's not a flashback to Calvary. It's not an imitation of Calvary. It is Calvary, the sacrifice of our Lord. And he does not want that. And this persecution of the traditional Mass and the elimination of it and the persecution of those who want it and the practice of it is straight from the heart of Satan, the heart of darkness. You've mentioned that the bishops, in most cases, have lost the faith. It seems like they harbor a resentment towards those that still have it. Absolutely, absolutely, and they will persecute them. They will, they will get them arrested. Uh, as I say, in certain parishes, you will be arrested. Even if you kneel down for Holy Communion, what they call Holy Communion, they will refuse it. And if you keep on, they will call a policeman and get you ejected for disorder, public disorder. And the priest is in charge of the church, and he can say, this man, this woman, is, is creating a nuisance here. And they, the police have been called and have ejected the people because they wanted to kneel down. You're not supposed to kneel any longer because kneeling down means you adore. And they, there's nothing to adore. They don't believe there's anything there to adore. Therefore, why kneel down, my friend? And why give the wrong ideas that the bread is the body of Christ? Because it isn't the body of Christ for them. And the wine is not the blood of Christ for them. Now, we had, before we started this conversation, privately talked about... Uh, situations where bishops are at a fell swoop closing 30 and 40 sometimes even uh, 50 churches that's right that's right they are doing that and the, the, the reasons vary from diocese to diocese uh, in certain dioceses it is that they lack the priests they haven't nourished vocations and uh, joined with that they need money why well sometimes it's for out of court settlements for cases of pedophilia Sometimes it's that they want money, period, like any man wants money for themselves. And um, they're not going to pay, pay the insurance and the property rights and the property taxes and all those buildings, and they have no intention of nourishing the people. But do they realize um, what it does to the morale of the people when they close 30 churches at once? They don't care. They don't care about that. They do not care about the person. You see, to care about that, Bernard, you would want to be a believer you'd want to really be sorry that people are sorry and are bereaved for the lack that the church they were baptized in, they were married in, they went to Mass in, and that the children used to go to is being closed. Uh, you'd, want to be, you'd want to be a believer, but they are not believers. They don't believe any longer. They have airy-fairy ideas about round churches and new churches and assembly halls. They have nothing to do with the Roman Catholic tradition, so they don't care. If you don't care, then you regard these fanatics, these zealots who want the old churches as fuddy-duddies, as old-fashioned, as not in tune with the modern life, as, as not up-to-date. It's, it's very clear. But you see, again, come back to my, my pet grumble and peeve. The intelligent, the still-believing, middle-of-the-road conservatives who put up with all this don't are only beginning, they don't realize it, they're only beginning to realize there's something fundamentally wrong, not working. The whole machine is not working any longer. The, 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 the Catholic structure is no longer turning over. It's, 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 it's off-key, it's breaking down. Uh, the, the, the cogs are not turning. There's no oil. Uh, the thing is not functioning. They're only beginning to admit that, because to admit it really, and to say that we have um, Judases amongst the bishops and to say that we um, are really up a creek with no paddles to say that will mean a complete change of life and they are not ready for a change of life because they're comfortable and they're fat cats now this concludes um, our first uh, interview in the next interview we're going to talk about how the Pope fits into all of this okay all right we've just had a discussion about uh, the bishops and the next subject that I'd like to discuss is that of the Holy Father oh. because to me it seems that the point that is causing most difficulty 
for faithful Catholics is that of the Pope. With the bishops, of course, there's this great disappointment that uh, we have been abandoned, and as, as a result, there seems to be an increasing anger against the bishops. Have you um, had that same experience oh, when yes. talking to the oh, faithful? Oh, oh yes. There's the, the, as I say, it's not merely a lack of respect any longer. They now uh, fulminate against the bishops. They accuse them, and rightly so. The bishop is finally the man who has the ultimate say-so in the parishes and over his priests and nuns and over the schools and um, they're not, it's not that they now merely lack respect for the bishop it is that they attack them they say what are these men doing they're simply fat cats that are living off the money we give and they're not defending the church they're not standing up for the law of God and the law of Christ um, uh, no they now are attacking them and they're criti critiquing them yeah so the situation with the bishops is disappointing, but it's fairly clear-cut. Yes, yes, it's fairly clear-cut. Now, with the Holy Father, we're into a different uh, situation. There seems to be a fair amount of confusion. And I'll set up a scenario, and then we can go from there. Yes. Um, some good, faithful, traditional Catholics are very critical of this Pope. Others... Uh, say that he is a staunch defender of the faith. So within the same camp you have some disagreement. Now amongst the liberals too, you have some liberals that are very hostile towards uh, the present Holy Father because of his stands, let's say, on abortion and artificial contraception. And yet you have others who claim that he is supporting their agenda. Perhaps you could shed some light on this confusion. Well, I'll tell you, Bernard, I may not be able to shed light on it, but we can review the entire question. Because between you and me and the Holy Spirit, there is no other question so agonizing for Roman Catholics today, more agonizing than the question of John Paul II, John Paul II. Who is he? What sort of a Pope is he? Is he Pope? What does he mean? Why doesn't he do certain things? Why does he do other things? Is he really helping us all? Is he really devoted to Our Lady? Does he know what's going on? Is he a puppet? Uh, is he a modernist? Is he really Pope? All those questions are being flung around about this, this one man. He's now with us since October 16, 1978. That's a long time. And it is, veritably, the evening of his papacy. It may be a long evening, but he's in the evening of his papacy. His health, to just to touch on it at the present moment, actuarially, he can last another four to seven years. He's had trouble. He's been shot at, of course, uh, the assassination attempt. He has osteoporosis. He has a, a megalovirus that they can't control. He was operated for cancer. Um, and he's had, he's had some accidents and he's had some ischemic attacks like a lot of very active men I've had ischemic attacks but he's there and the question is what is he finally is he really our Pope and remember but let's recall one thing about the Pope you could say that by the year 35 AD the church was up and going Pentecost had taken place the apostles were abroad our Lady had gone to live with John the Apostle himself. They were preaching already and were spreading the faith. They were getting converts, thousands of converts. From that time, the year 35 AD, until now, we have had an unbroken line of single men, the popes. 264 of them. Peter and 263 successors. An unbroken line. Some of them saints, some of them sinners. Some of them scholars, some of them very stupid men, uh, but all in that line. We've had an unbroken line. We're the only unbroken line from Christ. That we can say that our Pope, if he's validly elected, and he is the Bishop of Rome, and the successor of Peter, we know that we are in physical contact with the historical Jesus. We hail from a man who lived and ate with Jesus, who saw him crucified, and who was, uh, went, uh, who was appointed by him as head of the church. So we have that connection, that physical connection. No other church has that. 
that's our claim and that's Roman Catholicism and that's our pride and that's our strength we have that historical connection it's not a vague thing uh, somebody appointed because people pray over him no we know that he is one of the 264 successors this is our pride our strength and our weakness and our weakness so then a Catholicism without a papacy is not real Catholicism no it's not ceased to be because only to Peter did Christ say on you I'm going to build the church and you are the rock and what sins you loose on earth they're loosed on earth and heaven and what sins you don't uh, the, what you bind what you impose on earth are bound in heaven and I will be with you until the last day and the gates of hell will not prevail against you that he's the only one who got that promise and believe you me in their heart of hearts the other churches all of them they know this they realize that. That's why somebody said that if tomorrow morning the papacy ceased to exist, if the Catholic Church, in other words, ceased to exist, the bottom would fall out of Christianity. It then become an accident of history, which is the fond desire of our enemies, of course, and will never happen. Anyway, that's just to characterize what the papacy is for us. And we don't, we don't expect the Pope to be a holy. We call him His Holiness because he represents the all-holy. And... Uh, uh, and he does represent the All Holy. Now, as regards this particular man, Carol Whatever, now 76 years old, or in his 76th year, Bishop of Rome, elected on October 16, 1978, by a majority of bishops, of, of cardinals in the conclave. First of all, his election was utterly valid. I'm paid to know what a valid election is and so are hundreds and hundreds of others and we know the election was valid he was elected validly as Pope there's no doubt about that and he did accept it validly so he is Pope and by the way he's the only Pope we have so that's why we're bothered about it if we have any worries at all about this one man it's the biggest worry we can have we worry about homosexuality, we worry about pornography, we worry about pedophilia, we worry about the decadence, we worry about uh, all these things, but those are minor worries compared to this one thing. Are we secure in our Pope? Have we got a Pope? And is he really Pope? That's the question. Now, why does the question arise in the case of John Paul II? It didn't arise in the case of Pacelli, uh, Pius XII, or Pius XI, or John XXIII, or Paul VI. Uh, or any of the other posts. Why does it arise in his case? Oh, it arises for very good reasons. Very good reasons. First of all, look at the magnitude of this man. I mean, let's appreciate it. He came last month, October. He came to the United States. And he stayed in the, Washington, in the New York, Baltimore area for four days. There is no other human being alive who could get 175,000 people into Central Park, whale, hail, hail or shrine, and he did, or get 95,000 to stand in sheet rain for mass another evening, or to go out to aqueduct for another evening, uh, 84,000. There's no human being alive, no matter who he is. A foreigner could come in and have to be greeted by the United States President and by the panoply of, of the media. No. He's the only man who could do that, and he did it. That's impressive. All right. Now, if you take away the hoopla and the public uh, relations, what was really the result of such a visit is something else. And if you wish to, at the end of this tape, we can discuss what is the result of a visit like that. Is it really good for the church, for the faith? Does it really do good, or is it merely that? Hoopla. Public relations. To get back to the main question about him, though, what's wrong, or what apparently is wrong? Many things seem wrong. All right, I give you a scenario. Uh, he decides to give a concert for the Holocaust in the Vatican. And he's going to hold it in the Hall of Audiences, this huge, enormous hall built by Paul VI beside the Basilica of St. Peter. Excellent choice. And it's standing room only, SRO. And it's distinguished. And that evening they had uh, a huge menorah put at the... At the uh, at the uh, at the base of the of the it's a long sloping uh, um, uh, uh, hall, and there were uh, it has seven candlesticks of course seven branches, and there were seven survivors of Auschwitz holding their grandchildren who lit each of the, the candles of the menorah, and they had the London Philharmonic uh, Orchestra under Gilbert Levine, who um, played all the beautiful music including the Kol Nidre, 
But there were difficulties, of course, because Rabbi Toaf and the other Jews who arranged with the Holy Father, Rabbi Toaf is the rabbi of Rome, said, look, we don't like the presence of Gustav Mahler, the musician, on the schedule. He was, his music was supposed to be played. And the Pope likes Mahler. They said because he was converted, he became a Christian. So the Pope said, okay, remove him. And they said, we don't like the crucifix hanging in the hall. The Pope said, we'll remove it. It was taken down and put in a closet for the duration of the concert. And the Holy Father spoke. He spoke a very moving speech. And the speech, by the way, could have been given by the Grand Rabbi himself or by the head of the, the Grand Master of the Masonic Lodge of New York. There was nothing Catholic about it. There was nothing Christian about it at all. It was humanistic. Now, the question is, when Christ said, he that will deny me before men, I will deny him before God the Father. Surely, this man who is the successor of Peter and the vicar of Jesus should have said, all right, we're here to commemorate the six million Jews reputedly killed in Auschwitz, massacred by the Nazis. I want to tell you that we are led by a man who was crucified for all men's sins. He suffered the greatest thing. And he can understand the sufferings and your sufferings. He didn't mention the word, didn't mention our Lord's name, didn't mention the passion, didn't mention the man of sorrows, didn't mention the reparation he committed. But people say, isn't that funny? He is Pope. Uh, I'll take another scenario. He goes to Haiti last year, this year, 95. And he sits down with the voodoo priests, 15 of them, on chairs, like as if they were equals. And he gives his sermon and says, well, uh, he gives a, has a conversation and his opening gambit is, look, I understand your views and uh, you have a perfect right to these, and, um, uh, but we wish you would also understand our point of view. Is this the apostle? Do you think St. Paul would have said that? Do you think St. Peter would have said it? Do you think the Pius the Ninth, Pius the Tenth, Pius the Eleventh, the Pius the Twelfth would have said that? Oh no, 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 they would not. Um, you know that Pius X was approached by a man called Theodor Herzl. Theodor Herzl is the man who founded the idea, the Zionist movement, and the idea of back to Palestine. And he went to the Pope in 1903 or 4, asking Pius X would he support the idea of a Jewish return to Jerusalem and to uh, Palestine. And the Pope said, well, you people denied Jesus, and you crucified him. And until you acknowledge Christ as the Savior, we can't support you. Contrast that scene with the scene of the the concert, the, sh the Holocaust Memorial. That's the difference between the popes that were and this present pope. And people say, is he really Catholic to do that? Then, for instance, he's visited in Rome by the Patriarch of Constantinople, a man called uh, Dimitrios at that time. And now it's called Bartholomew. And you know, St. Peter's has a balcony, a loggia, they call it, on w from which the pope blesses the crowd in St. Peter's Square. St. Peter's Basilica. Well, he and this patriarch stood there and gave a joint blessing to the people assembled in the square. But Bartholomew is a heretic, and he's a schismatic. How can you stand with this heretic and schismatic and join in praying? I mean, is this Catholic? Would Pius the Ninth have done it, or Pius the Tenth, or Pius the Eleventh, or Pius the Twelfth? No. Would Gregory the Fourteenth have done it? No. Innocent the Third? Any Pope would have done it? No. This man does it then I can go on and on and on, but the point is that he is behaving in a way which is very surprising. And we have a problem about that because... It's the whole pattern of ecumenism here. That's right. And then if you read his book, the Th Crossing the Threshold of Hope, and one of the questions he discusses there is the question is, um, must you be a Roman Catholic? And when you read that chapter, at the end of it, you say to yourself, no, you haven't got to be a Roman Catholic. As far as this Pope is concerned, you haven't got to be a Roman Catholic in order to be saved, to be justified in front of God. No matter how you turn or twist his sentences, there's no way. Now, this is a problem, because, for instance, his motto is totus tuus, which is the Latin for completely yours, and it means that he's a complete and total servant of Our Lady. But would Our Lady have done that? And then why has he allowed Sister Lucia to be obscured and the whole message of Fatima to fall into chiaroscuro? At some point I'd like to go into uh, the subject of Fatima in greater detail. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. But anyway, the point is he's supposed to be the Pope of Fatima. He's supposed to... I mean, when he was, when he was 
uh, travelling around the square in 1981, May 13, travelling around in his Popemobile, and he was shot by Muhammad Ali Aksha. We know now it's because of Our Lady Fatima that he was saved, that the bullets did not hit his brain. They only hit his body, because he bent down to pick up a little child who had a picture of Our Lady Fatima on her blouse. And because he bent down, the bullets went over his head, and they hit two American tourists, by the way, who now have them on their mantelpieces as mementos. But, uh, he, so he is a pope devoted to Our Lady. But then why has he allowed the Roman Courier to suppress Fatima and to suppress statues and uh, pilgrimages to Fatima? And why has he not uh, revealed the third secret, which he should have? Or thought, done the consecration or done to the cons He hasn't done the consecration. If he's so devoted to Our Lady, why? Why? So, the, these are big problems and... How are you to reason about this, Bernard? How can one reason about these things? And still, see, he is the only Pope we have. And you must maintain that, because he is Pope. He has not, not ceased to be Pope. He's not a heretic. And if he were a heretic, who's going to declare him a heretic? Who has the authority? Nobody. But he's not a heretic. He's not teaching heresy. And everybody knows he stands up uh, for the poor and the oppressed. And he stands up for the unborn and he stands up against homosexuality, he stands up against uh, pornography, he stands up against all oppression. There's no man in this world can accuse this Pope of not being the champion of the weak and the helpless. There's no doubt about that. But as a Pope, then you see, when he writes a letter to the United Nations, on negotiations, by the way, and he starts off, I, John, Bishop of Rome and Son of Humanity, what on earth does that mean? Why doesn't he say, I, John, Bishop of Rome, and Vicar of Jesus Christ on earth, successor to the Apostles? He doesn't. He doesn't. What is this? What is... How do you judge this man? Is he Pope? Yes, he is Pope. Yes, he is Pope. Until he dies, he's Pope. The difficulty is this, that you have to have some explanation, something to explain what's happening. You know, the biggest problem in all this planet is something much more simple that I'm making. It's this. Christ appointed him Pope. What intention had Christ in appointing this man? When he was made Pope in 1978, already the shambles of the Church, the disaster of the Church, the falling away of the faithful, the decadence of bishops, the decadence of seminaries, the lack of vocations, all that was manifest between 1965 and 1978, it was clear to anybody who wanted to see it, the church was in trouble, all over. Not in one part of the world, not in another, not in one small point, but at all points. On every point we're in trouble. Now, Christ is all-powerful. He could have elected anybody. Now, for instance, there was a cardinal at that concert called Cardinal Giuseppe Siri. Giuseppe Siri. He was the Cardinal Archbishop of Genoa, son of a fisherman, powerful family, powerful man, who made it quite clear when he was asked in the conclave, that conclave of 1978, what he would do, he would take out a battle axe and cut off heads and suppress seminaries and expel bishops and get rid of uh, heretical professors and uh, wipe out certain orders of nuns. And as for homosexuality, finito. He would have taken action. In other words, it would be a witch hunt and a head hunt. Christ didn't make him Pope. He made Carol Wotiba Pope, who is quiescent, who has allowed everything to happen, who's taken no action. The only person this man has ever excommunicated was Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, who championed the Roman class. It's the only person excommunicated by John Paul II. And that's extraordinary. So Christ didn't put in a theory he put in Carol Rotiva, the Pope. And therefore Christ had some reason for putting this man in. Now, if you ask me what the reason is, I'm not, I can't claim to know the mind of Christ. I, I can guess, though, I can guess. If Christ said to himself, in his divine wisdom, this structure is utterly rotten. If I put in a theory, he's going to prolong it. If I put in a Rotiva, he's going to be quiescent, he's going to let it rot further. It'll go faster. Then I can start rebuilding. That's the only way I can reason about it. But that, the conclusion about it all is this, though, Bernard. 
and then I, I should stop talking and you may have some questions about it. But the general conclusion is this, that you and I must make as loyal Catholics, that now is the time when we will now say no to the Pope. If he does something we know is not any good, because we have the faith to it. And both theologians and lay people would have to say to their bishop, no, no, we will not go along with this. This is against our faith. And to assert their faith. Because it's now the function of the laity to say to both Pope and bishops, I'm sorry, we won't go along with this. We won't allow our churches to be taken. We'll leave you. We won't give our money to you. We'll build our own little church down the street made of wood and tin. But then we'll worship with a proper priest. Unless you give us a proper priest, we'll get them ordained by, the, by other people. We'll have priests, and we'll have baptism, we'll have confession. Is there a precedent in scriptures or in church history for saying no to the hierarchy? Oh yes, oh yes, there is. The Arian heresy was one where the, the lady said no. Uh, and down, down through the ages, people have resisted, and St. Thomas himself says that you have to approach the bishops and the Pope, if necessary, in public, to make them stop making mistakes. He was talking about ordinary mistakes, not even heresy. So you, you are bound to, but you'd be a very brave man today, a very brave priest, a very brave monsignore, a very brave theologian who would say to a, a bishop, no, Your Excellency, you're wrong. It is not Catholic faith. You are a heretic. You are speaking heresy. You are making a big mistake. You're falling into error. Give me some theologian who would dare say that. But yet, um, the very first man that uh, Christ picked as his uh, successor, St. Peter, uh, was in some ways a weak man who... He was. He made a horrible mistake in Antioch, at the old town of Antioch, where Paul found that he was... Uh, St. Paul went to visit him, and he found that he was deceiving people. With the, with the Jews, he was pretending to be still a Jew, although he was a Christian. And with non-Jews, he was presenting not to be a Jew, present, pre, pre, pretending not to be a Jew. And Paul said, you can't do that. You can't do that. That's not the new faith. And he reproached him. And poor St. Peter, you know, in one of his letters, you know what he says about St. Paul? He says there are many hard things in Paul. <laughs> there were. He was reproached in public. And Paul stood up in front of everybody, reproached him. And that's what we have to do now to our Pope and our bishops and our priests. We'll say, no, no, Father. No, no, Your Excellency. No holiness. We won't accept that. We won't go along with that. That is not our faith. And we won't give you our money either. We won't go to your church. We won't support you. You're not acting according to the Catholic faith. We have to tell them that now from now on. And challenge them. Challenge them. That is, I'm afraid, our function. Now, as regards the Holy Father, uh, I think that there's one other aspect of him which we must deal about, and that's his mind, his intellect, and his whole intellectual tradition. Because that's the key to this Pope. And that's what many people find difficult to understand. What is John Paul II's mindset? We've got to go into that. Um, uh, here's the essence of it all. John Paul II is a Pope. He was educated in Poland. He's, he has what we know, those who lived in Europe, called a middle European mentality. John Paul II is not a Thomist. He's not a Thomist philosopher. Sure, he knows St. Thomas, he studied him, but he's not a Thomist. He doesn't think like a Thomist. John Paul II is a phenomenologist. Could what you define that? Yeah. What is that? Phenomenology is a, 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 a so-called branch of philosophy that's built on a completely different principle from Thomism. See, Thomist philosophy is a philosophy of realism. It says, okay, what is a human being? It has a, he has a body and a soul and senses, and uh, it goes to uh, analyzing the objective reality of a human being. Or what is a chair, or a table, or a tree, or the sky, or rain, or flowers? What are they? They're, it's a realism. Phenomenology says, no, no, that's not the interesting point. The, the interesting point is my relationship to this object. So it examines, examines your relationship to the chair, your relationship to another person, your relationship to the sky, to flowers, to an animal. It's an examination of the relationship. And that's why John Paul II has this analysis, the acting person. It's a study of the, the relationship of an action to an object. It's an entirely different approach. And it also, it doesn't say the object is real. It just says there's a thing called my typewriter and here's the relationship I have to my typewriter. It's an analysis of that kind. It's not Thomism. 
The result is that it hasn't got any sure foundation of metaphysics. It has no, it doesn't explain anything about the Blessed Sacrament, about our Lord's body and blood in the, in the bread and the wine, uh, when they, once they've been converted, once they've been consecrated. It doesn't explain anything about mortal sin or venial sin of the soul, it, because you can't see the soul. It's, it's not a phenomenon. A phenomenon is something you can touch and see and smell and carve and, uh, and modify uh, and, uh, and embrace or throw away, but uh, phenomenology. So he's a phenomenologist. And therefore, he, he's dealing with relationships, not with reality, with things. And that makes his language very obscure. And I've read as much of John Paul II's writings as I can, the ones in Polish I can't read. But I've read everything else, and a lot of it translated. I defy you to understand it. I defy you, even a man of your mind, and with, with your training and my training. Because it's it's an entirely different mentality, and it's uh, so that's the first thing about him. You must remember, he's a, a middle European intellectual. He has not got our uh, tra intellectual tradition. He's not a Thomist. He doesn't think like Saint Thomas. He doesn't even profess Thomistic philosophy. He's a phenomenologist. He deals with this shadowy, vague uh, consideration of what my relationship to an object is. That's uh, that's all he that's that's all he deals with. The second thing about John Paul II is he's a Pole. And there's a characteristic of Pole, Poles and Poland that we forget. Do you know that long before, uh, before, the, before Luther, before anything like that, there was a toleration in Poland that was nowhere. It had the largest body of Scotch Covenanters at the Reformation. And they were perfectly free. Jews had a special state within Poland. They hadn't got to speak Polish, they hadn't got to be in the Polish army, they had their own newspapers, they had special privileges, they had special cities set up for themselves, and special laws governing their commerce. The toleration of Jews in Poland was something out of this world, long before they were tolerated anyplace else. Long before there was freedom for the Jews, there was that for Poland. They developed a certain freedom. They had a bicameral legislature, by the way, they had newspapers, they had uh, 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 they had um, what do we call them? The, the the amendments of the constitution, the human rights. We had they had a human rights list that we never had, and they called it golden liberty, libertas aurea, and they defended that. And remember, they had there was a Polish empire once upon a time, and it was one of the biggest empires in Europe in its day. It didn't last very long because Russia came in and France came in and Austria came in. The point is this: that what I'm saying is that the Polish mentality is very very broad-minded. It's, it's very permissive, very permissive. And he still has this deference. So if a man becomes a bishop, well, the man is a bishop. And even if he's a homosexual bishop, as we have many in the United States, uh, it's still his bishop. You respect him. Now, he's not a fiery Italian or a, a fiery Spaniard or a solid German who says, listen, you're a sinner, get the hell out of here. Leave this seminary, leave this diocese. No, he's not like that. So he's got this mentality, this deferential attitude of the Poles to authority and to other people's opinions. They're very broad-minded in that sense. So this is the second weakness. I consider it a weakness in John Paul II. The third thing is that he um, he's a geopolitician. That is, he thinks, perhaps it's true, but he's persuaded that he knows what's happening in history. And that he sees around the corner, whereas ordinary mortals don't. Geopoliticians think that. And um, that's why at times, at times, and I make no implications when I say this, uh, Bernard, at times when you hear John Paul II talking, you think you're talking to a Freemason. This is the same view of history, the same idea of history moving. And uh, there is that touch in him, and he's not a Freemason, never was. And not, I don't think he has great difficulty about Freemason. He hasn't got the difficulty I have at all. There's another weakness in him, too. He's not... He's not very much alive to the danger of the Masonic threat to the Church. He's not alive to that. Why? I do not know, but he's not. Uh, the marvelous, the, 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 not the marvelous thing, but the surprise is that he was the great, his great mentor was Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski. Stefan Wyszynski was the primate of Poland and the man who made what he were, really, his protector and creator. And he was also called the Fox of Europe and he was violently anti-Masonic violently anti-communist. In 1981, when Watiba was lying in Gemelli Hospital in Rome from his wounds, and uh, Wyszynski came to die of very bad cancer, 
and they could speak on the phone to each other. They couldn't meet again. And he died, Vyshinsky died, and was buried before the Pope could get to him. Uh, because the Pope didn't recuperate for three months, well, into November of 1981. But that, that, that he, after all that, after all, after being with Vyshinsky, that he's developed in this way is very surprising. Very surprising, because he is permissive. And uh, it's all right to travel around the world. And let me go back now to the papal visit the king that was here, uh, that, he, that he made in October. These marvelous trips, these... In Chaustachova, for instance, once he gathered 1.3 million young people. And in San Jacques de Compostela in Spain another year, he had 1.2 million young people. And then he was at Denver where he assembled all these people and again took the country by storm. The, the president had to go down and meet him. And this time the president had to come to New York and say hello to him and speak with him and see, be seen in public. And both men, Clinton and Gonzalez, are not uh, by any means practicing Catholics. On the contrary, they're anti-Catholic. They're, they love killing babies and they're, 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 they are pagans. They are pagans. Now, what is the result of all these papal trips? Well, one result is this, or one thing happening is this, that while he's away traveling, and he travels a good deal of parts of the year, and he's been traveling, he's traveled to 92 countries already, and he's gone around the world so many times, and he's been seen by everybody and talked by everybody, the church in Rome has fallen into the hands of his enemies, of the enemies, we think, the enemies of the church. Those who are plotting his downfall, his resignation, at the present moment, they want him to resign him. That's what I want to get on to. His fate is coming up this year, 1996, by the way. It's coming up to be considered. And uh, he's not taking care of the house. He's not governing the church. And nobody, the last thing anybody would say about this man is that he's a wise governor of the church. He's not. He doesn't govern the church. He reigns, if you want to put it like that. As a, as, a, as a figurehead. He doesn't govern the church. And he doesn't choose bishops. He didn't choose Cardinal uh, Bernardine of Chicago, for instance. He didn't choose these people. They were put in by their friends and he signed the document. Now, look at this man as he is now. I'm not breaking confidences and I'm not speculating either idly when I tell you that the greatest pressure on John Paul II now, and for the last three years, is that he resigned. What's the argument? The argument is this. Holy Father, you will be, in 1995, you will be 75 years old. The law is that once a bishop, and you're bishop of Rome, once a bishop is 75, he has to submit his resignation. You're a bishop. Now, there's no doubt in my minds, nor in your minds, that the unity between you and your bishops is broken if it ever existed. The bishops don't like you. They don't like you, sir. And they don't. And this, most of the cardinals disagree with you. Your latest cardinal, Cardinal uh, Martini, is going to, he says if he were made pope, he would experiment with female priests. Or with married priests. And that for you is abhorrent. You say the church can't do it. He says they could do it. And many other cardinals think so too. And many bishops disagree with your strictures about homosexuality and about divorce and contraception and a fetal research. And uh, therefore the unity between you and your bishops is broken, if it ever existed. Why don't you resign and let us elect a man with whom the bishops feel united and therefore give the church strength? If the church is, has weakness nowadays, it is because we're not united with your Holy Father. People disagree with you and you're too stiff. And uh, you did good work, you did help in destroying the Soviet Union, and you did do a few great things like that. Now can't you retire, or retire to Chanstakova, to the monastery of Chanstakova, retire to Monte Cassino, live in Rome. The amount of good you'll do as ex-pope and consultant will be huge. Meanwhile, we'll have a younger man whom the bishops trust more. And by the way, Holy Father, you are just a bishop like the rest of us. Yes, you do occupy the venerable see of Rome, but you're only a bishop, first among equals. So now we're beginning to see how uh, hideous this whole concept of collegiality actually is. That's right. That was, and that was the plan from the very beginning. And when Father McGee, now Bishop McGee, went down to retrieve his breviary or his book or his comb when he left in the conference room and scuffed the floor and found these two or three sheets of paper and found in the handwriting of a very well-known Peritus, who is now dead, by the way, and who is now heretic, as an, an Austrian, when he found there the plan of strategy, if we get this vote through, we have the papacy by its neck, we can choke it and kill it off and rush back to Paul VI. Now we know 
the error of Paul the Sixth made in not stopping that boat and stopping the whole docu do document and wiping it out. He had the power to do so. And writing an ineffectual note, the Nota Explicativa, which nobody remembers, which is printed in the index of volumes now. Well, now we know what the plan was. That was in 1964. It is now 1995. And all the damage has been done. And all the bishops have been given the idea that they're little popes and that they're just as... They, they can cock a snoot at the Pope. They can say no to the Pope. They do say no to the Pope. Now we know what was planned. And yet, and yet here's my pet peeve, my grumble coming out again, yet my intelligent theologians and good people whom I know all over the church, not in America and Canada alone, but in Europe and in Africa and in Asia, they are still refusing to stand up and say, boys and girls, men and women, my brethren and my sistren, it's all over. We are going down the drain unless we change. There's something radically wrong in our structure. Not with our faith, but with our structure. But they're not saying that because to do that, they've got to give up their salaries. They've got to be in revolt. They've got to say no to the bad bishops. They've got to say no to the Holy Father when he makes a mistake, because he's making mistakes. They've got to say no to their parish priests. They've got to resist their nuns. They've got to resist the feminists among the feminazis, as we call them, amongst the nuns. They've got to resist all that and fight. No, they don't want to do that. They're fat cats. They're too comfortable. That means war. That means losing friends. And we've ceased to be a church militant. We are no longer a church militant. There's no church militant on this earth at the present moment. And, you see, here's the problem, Bernard. Uh, I've been giving you, again, my pet peeve for the third time, and I'll keep on repeating this, because, I'm, because I'm, I'm beginning to see some of them scratching their heads already and looking sideways askance, knowing that some of the good people are saying, yeah, there's something wrong. Christ is allowing this. My good and gentle Lord Jesus, who loves his church, St. Paul says he loves it as a bride, and is without spot and wrinkle. He's leaving this happen, his church. Now, by the way, talk about the church for one moment. We'll be quite clear about this. When St. Paul says the church of God is a, the bride of Christ and without spot and wrinkle, what does he mean? He's talking about every soul on earth, in purgatory, and in heaven, who is in the state of grace. And if they're in the state of grace, they're without spot or wrinkle. That's the mystical body of Christ. That's the body of the saved. You must belong to that. If you're a Muslim or a Jew or a Mormon or a Baptist, you will not be saved unless you're associated with that and get grace from it. One way or the other, get grace from it before you die, because if you don't, you're dead for eternity. Now, that's the church. Why is Christ allowing this to happen to his church? Because Christ is all loving. And he has a purpose in mind. He's supremely intelligent, he's omnipotent, and he has a mind all his own. He's not the same as us. He thinks totally different. That he has something. And therefore, what do we do about this? Well, first thing is, we acknowledge the situation. And then tell ourselves, we know what to do. We know you must get confession. You must get Holy Communion. You must go to Mass. You must say a prayer. You must say a rosary. You must keep clean. You must try and propagate the faith. You needn't bother about anything else. Just your obligations, your children, uh, your, 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 your friends, your work. Do what you should do. Christ will take care of the rest of it. But don't be deceived. And you cannot go along because it's, you get along by going along. You don't do that any longer. Because if you do, you'll lose your faith. You will lose it for certain. That's the only thing you can say about it. Now, as regards the Holy Father himself then, um, what's the prognostication? What's the, what can we expect? Bernard, we can expect much suffering at the hands of this Holy Father. He is not going to vindicate us. He is not going to protect us. He is not going to uh, vindicate Roman Catholicism as the only religion. He is not going to. He is not going to. It's not his principle. He wrote a letter recently, Ut unum sint, is a phrase taken from the Gospel, that they may be one. It's about ecumenism. And in the, if you read that letter very carefully, you'll find that there isn't one quotation from anybody prior to 1965. There isn't one quotation from, from the Fathers, not one quotation from previous Popes, from previous Councils, nothing. Just Vatican II and since. And wasn't there some talk about reshaping the papacy in that encyclical? Secondly, and that's most important, he said that, yes, I am the Bishop of Rome, and... Uh, uh, I occupy this scene and the papacy. I, I am the Pope. I occupy the papacy. But perhaps we can understand this in a new way. 
Bernard. That could be interpreted in a very, very bad way. It could be interpreted in a modernist way of evolution, modernist evolution. I don't think he meant that. He's again phenomenologist. He's again clawing at the relationship. He's not dealing with the reality that Christ said, you are Peter, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And the gates of hell will not prevail against you. And feed my lambs and feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? He's forgotten all that. The, the dazzling picture of Greeks and Russians and Jews and Muslims meeting in Mount Sinai, meeting in Jerusalem with him in the year 2000, this is dancing ahead of him as the, as the great achievement. Whereas there's only one achievement, Bernard, let me say it out loud, for the Pope to hear and bishops to hear and priests to hear, everybody to hear, the only triumph Christ promised us is when a soul dies and doesn't go to hell, goes to purgatory or heaven. That's triumph for the Church. Otherwise, forget it. There's no triumph worth while bothering about. Now, I think we're beginning to understand why um, Yeshua, the Pope of John Paul II, is causing this uh, confusion amongst the faithful, because you've mentioned... Um, now let's say three weaknesses that he has let's say in um, philosophy in governance and uh, in his ecumenism and yet at the same time uh, he's a co complex character because he's also a man of considerable, considerable strengths let's say in devotion to Our Lady or standing for uh, absolutely. great moral values absolutely 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 this is the contradiction and you see uh, I, the only saving grace is that he's been anointed Pope. Otherwise, I would not have anything to do with this man. I consider him a very dangerous character. Now, how is it that these contradictory characteristics, some negative, some positive, can coexist in the mind of uh, one man? What you're asking me, really, is... What does this mean about the faith of John Paul II? Mm -hmm. What does it mean for his Catholic Catholicism? Because it's, it's very complex here, because there's both these strengths and these weaknesses. Certainly, I'll tell you this much. Neither Pius the Ninth, Pius the Tenth, Pius the Eleventh, or Pius the Twelfth would have tolerated a man with these views. They'd have sent him to a monastery, if he were a cardinal or a bishop. And certainly wouldn't have ordained him if he was in the seminary. They wouldn't have ordained him. He would not have been ordained much less consecrated bishop, much less have made a cardinal, much less elected pope. He wouldn't have got within the analysis roar of the papacy. That's for certain. Now, then, what are we to say? Well, you can say one or two or three things. You can say, well, Christ put him in. He has made prudential errors of a vast kind. He has made no vast error he hasn't taught heresy formally, uh, and he's going to die, and that'll be that, and Christ will judge him. We can't imitate him, but we can't judge him either, because he's Pope. The point is, we can judge him, and we, do, we have to judge him. We have to judge every man, but we don't judge him to condemn him, to refuse to see him as Pope. But that's another difficulty that comes up immediately, and really tortures the soul in this. Bernard, let me tell you about my father and mother, as an example. They rarely talked about religion, formally. They sent us to school, they sent us the proper ways, and if we brought up a question, they'd discuss it. But they didn't sit around a table and lecture us, ever. But I knew everything about my religion from watching my father and mother, their example. And I could see illustrated in them what patience was, what anger was, what gentleness was, what mourning was, what pain was. I, I learned everything by watching because a child know, knows everything but doesn't know it knows. In other words, you teach by what you do. By example. By example. If I apply that to the present Holy Father, the example is horrendous. I wouldn't be insistent on everybody becoming Catholic. I wouldn't be insistent on people sh uh, confessing their sins. I, I wouldn't be insistent on even being baptized. It's not necessary. It's not given as an absolute necessity by this Pope. And if you put it into question, which most of you remember, as you say, as yes, you should be. But he doesn't see that as a necessary for salvation. And that I cannot accept. And I cannot accept 
See, then it goes very far, because I, for instance, I know it's, it's chauvinistic of me, but I don't want a Pope I can sit at breakfast with and say, please pass the salt, Holy Father. I don't want to exchange fish and chips with him. I don't want to drink wine and clink glasses and shake his hand. I don't want that. I want a Pope I can venerate, because he does represent the Lord Jesus Christ, who is my judge and my saviour. I, 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 I just can't stand that. There was a very pathetic picture of John Paul II published a photograph. He married a very prominent couple in Rome, in the, in the Peter of Sitka, this year. And they took a photograph of the Pope standing with his mitre and crozier. This is the Pope, the 263rd successor of Peter, the vicar of our Lord Jesus, the patriarch of the West, the man who can bind and loose on earth, the only man who can bind and loose l l Lucifer on earth, standing, holding his crozier in one hand, and talking and chatting with them. It, it, it simply doesn't go. That's all about it. It doesn't go. The idea of sitting around on 15 chairs with 15 voodoo priests in Haiti and saying good morning to them, how are you? For the Pope? No. No, no. My Pope doesn't do that. He is the vicar of our Lord Jesus. There's some, some, some particularity about it, some specialty about it, isn't there? Yes, of course there is. But he doesn't do that. So he has lowered the papacy. The papacy. He has uh, de-dignified it. He has degraced it in that. Not disgraced it, but degraced it. And I resent that very much. And I just hope the next Pope won't do that. Um, but this man has done that. And therefore I disapprove of that. But still, if he were Pope, he was Pope. And he is Pope. That's the difficulty. And he has brought us to this low point where we are afraid of what he's going to do next. And we suspect that he won't support us when it comes to a pinch, comes to shove, and he won't. Because we've tried already, we've complained about our bishops, complained about our pedophiliac priests, we've complained about the cardinals, we've complained about masonry, we've complained about the, the, the foul uh, things allowed in the church. He has done nothing, nothing, whatever. And if you say that he's doing that in order to keep the peace, who needs peace? I've come on earth to fling a sword amongst men, Christ said. And if you said that they would kill him if he did otherwise, let them kill him as another martyr. Blood is that which founded our church, the blood of Jesus and the blood of martyrs. So all the arguments fade away and you're left finally with this lugubrious and solemn conclusion. He is our Pope. The time is coming when we'll have to say, no, Holy Father, we don't want this, we don't want that, we want something else. We don't accept uh, this, the, the ideas you have. We do venerate you as Pope. And uh, please help us in that, and give us the best you can give. But we have to resist him. We have to resist them when they're wrong, and popes can be wrong. Now, you've just returned uh, from Rome, mm -hmm. and I'd like to take a look at the general situation in Rome. What were some of your major impressions um, that you made during your visit? That Rome is full of apostates full of apostates, that the situation is shabby in the extreme, that it is a bureaucracy turning over for its own benefit, that it has no more idea of serving the Pope and serving the Church and serving people and saving souls than I have of jumping over the moon, and less ability to do so than I have of jumping over the moon, and that there is nothing coming out of Rome which is any good for the Universal Church at all, except misdirection and indirection. The impression is terrible. It is terrible. Lots of good people, lots of young students, lots of fervent nuns, lots of fervent uh, minor characters. But the body as such, the Roman courier, no, no. It's not working for Christ any longer. No wonder Christ is spitting it out of his mouth. No wonder he's deprived it of jurisdiction. No wonder people don't obey it. No wonder it has no longer got grace. No wonder it's broke financially, which it is because the promise of the early 50s and 60s that the Roman Church would finally develop its own banking system and be independent is gone. Too much corruption, too much scandals, too much loss of liquidity and prestige. So that's the impression you get there. And then the impossibility of working with this machinery, the, the skullduggery, the corruption. You know, in New York, I'm going to violate your, the ears of your chaste audience by telling you this. In New York, we have a horrible New York expression, saying in this city, only the big ass and the big dollar counts. It's the same thing in Rome. Just corruption. And that's the way it is. And uh, When God is going to clear that out, he'll clear it out. But believe you me, uh, it is something out of this world. It's most saddening.
it's most saddening. Now, I think some of the cardinals themselves are beginning to realize that there are problems in Rome and in the church. Um, did you follow at all um, Cardinal Stickler's yes. visit to the United yes, States? Uh, what was his major message? His major message was uh, his major message was this: We've got to get back to fundamentals. We've lost something. There is something awry everywhere, including at the at the at the headquarters of the church. Stickler is good, Albert Stickler, but he has no power. He's retired. He was librarian, a Vatican librarian, as you know. He has no power, he, but he does his best. And what did he say about the Mass? He said the Mass, we have to revert to the Mass. We have got to go back. There was a very big mistake made. There was a distortion, completely. And what he was saying between the lines was, the Novus Ordo is completely a mess. We must get back to the original, reform the, the, the entire structure we've built up since then. That's what he's saying quite plainly. And if you speak to Cardinal Gagnon, who's retired, same thing. If you speak to Cardinal Oddi, it's the same thing. If you speak to, say, Chappie, Cardinal, they say the same thing, but they're all retired and they're all helpless. And then some of them, let's face it, Cardinal Chappie, for instance, doesn't want to leave his apartment in the Vatican. So if he preaches against the current uh, opinions in the Vatican, he'll lose his apartment and have to go, to the, go outside. And he doesn't want to go outside, he wants to die in the Vatican. Thank you very much and happy Christmas, Cardinal Chappie. Now, what does it tell us? when men as high as cardinals and let's say use the example of uh, Cardinal Odi who yeah. told uh, someone I know who's been active in Univoce that within a few years the conciliar church is going to collapse Sure. what does it tell us when let's say men like as high up as Cardinal Steckler and Cardinal Odi make these kind of statements and no longer follow the party line what does it mean? it means this and uh, this is the, the hardest thing we can tell your audience, but let's, let's say it with, with uh, great prayerfulness and reverence. It means that Lucifer, Satan, has now been enthroned. There. He has power there. He has now paralyzed what used to be the central hub and heart of the church. He has that in his grasp. And that's where... That's where Marcel Lefebvre, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, was correct in saying that uh, Rome is full of apostates, and it is. The apostasy is rife in Rome. It is real apostasy. What does that mean? It means that they no longer seek the glory of Christ. They seek their own, and they've used the church and used sacred things to push their own self-benefits and their own interest. That's what it means, which is a terrible admission to make. And it means that you can... Uh, the, the accusation of malfeasance and misfeasance can be urged against Paul VI, John XXIII, and John Paul II, because they have allowed that to happen. In their watch, this has happened, and it shouldn't have happened. And if they didn't know it was happening, they should have known, and if they knew and did nothing about it, all the greater is their guilt. It does mean, though, that Satan has power in Rome. It now, does mean that. What does that mean for the faithful? Because if we follow the uh, line of argument that we followed in the first uh, tape with the bishops, yes. in the second interview with uh, the deplorable situation in Rome, it means now that uh, the laity and good priests and some good bishops cannot depend on the church structure. No, they can't. What they must do is this. There is no bishop. There is no priest who does not know where to look for doctrine in books and in records. And we have sufficiently good theologians, sufficiently good bishops. Not many of them, we have them. We all know what we should do now. We know what we should do. But the point is this, we must insist the others do it or get out and leave us alone. We must insist on this. We must not give them economic help. We must not give them our money. We must not give them our loyalty. And I could, but I won't, I could name off on one hand, or two hands, ten bishops in the United States and probably five in the Canada and you no longer owe them any allegiance they're no longer Catholic they, they, you shouldn't kiss their ring you shouldn't say yes father, no father you shouldn't say yes your excellency, no your excellency they should be shunned they are not Catholic any longer so one is not bound to obey then a bishop let's say who still holds his office but has lost his faith no He's, a, he's an apostate, he's outside, he's excommunicated, auto-excommunicated, he's outside the church. He has no right to his office any longer. They will insist on it, but uh, I'll, I'll preserve you. That's our difficulty with them. 
because they're mutually supporting each other and they support each other they certainly do and you can't break that phalanx and that's the difficulty is there that they have these national conferences of bishops and no bishop can dare step outside that otherwise he's going to be crippled they're going to cripple him and he will have nothing to say and he will lose money and he can't do anything in Rome and he can't get permissions that he needs uh, he can't get annulments uh, he can grant them but he can't get them um, and uh, he's going to be crippled and to be shunned by his fellow bishops and no bishop wants to be shunned by his fellow bishops besides most bishops want to travel higher they want to become an archbishop or a cardinal so they're going to stay in favor with the powers that be so they're caught unless they revolt so power has replaced principle then yeah power has replaced principle now this leads on to another question then if uh, the hierarchy has abandoned us essentially um, there's the whole question of the underground church I know uh, good priests who are, let's say, leaving uh, vestments and uh, chalices and that kind of thing in people's homes and quietly going around sure, saying sure, mass. Sure. Do you think there's going to be more of this in the future? Well, Bernard, if you want to gauge the myopia of the bishops and the ignorance of the Pope, then come with me sometime and let me visit with you the underground church in the United States. If the bishops and the Pope knew the extent of the underground network where we have masses, baptisms, confessions, bishops and priests and nuns, seminaries, libraries, all our own, and they know nothing about it. It's a, it's a, it's a small minority, but now it's spreading everywhere. And you can go from city to city from the under, in the underground church and never touch the normal church, never go near the normal priest, never listen to the, the, the ordinary bishop of the place. Because there's this network growing of people saying, we know what we should do, we have the books, we have good priests, we have good bishops, let's go ahead and have it. And uh, forget the others, and that's what they're doing, because they can't shift them, because the others have canonical power, they're in power, they own the plant, you know, which they're selling off, by the way, as we said, uh, 40 at a time, 6 at a time, 4 at a clip, etc. But uh, they... they uh, if they knew how extensive it was, they'd be frightened. They'd be really frightened. And uh, they don't know that, though. And uh, we're not going to tell them. And the underground church is something which is flourishing at the present moment, and it's going to go on flourishing, because the young people, above all, are saying, hey, this is a great idea. This satisfies me. This gives me a reason for going to church. This enables me to avoid uh, lettery. It uh, avoids me. It helps me to make a good marriage. It teaches me what I should do. Uh, gives me laws of morality and gives me a belief I can accept. Is there perhaps an attitude amongst the um, hierarchy and the bishops that they don't want to know about this underground church? They don't want to know about it because it's too troublesome. They, uh, they, I've never even attempted to tell a bishop about this except one man. I, I know somebody who uh, tried to tell a bishop about it yeah. and he just uh, expressed uh, absolute... Uh, oh, yeah. Disbelief. And, Shock that uh, uh, this was going on. Yes, that, that, that means that the ground is being tunneled beneath them, being honeycombed. And it is. The ground between, beneath them is. And you see, there will come a generation of bishops, not long off, who suddenly find that they, they don't cut any ice. They don't cut any. They, 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 they're not of consequence. And people are not going to church. They're going elsewhere. And they've built little ramshackle things of their own. Or they're, they're in private homes. Uh, and. Uh, then you see, add to that, Bernard, this horrible fact that within your lifetime, probably, possibly within mine, but certainly within your lifetime, there's going to be a persecution. The church is going to be constrained socially and politically and culturally. And only those with a secret way of worshipping and getting Holy Communion and Confession, getting married and baptized and being anointed at their death is by the underground church. And this uh, fact leads us to what is going to be our next topic of conversation, which is Catholic devotion. That's right. The essence of Catholicism is in devotion. This interview with Father Malachi Martin, we're going to talk about the Catholic devotional life. But before we go into this topic, I'd like to uh, set the context that an individual or a family um, would be in for uh, setting up their uh, devotional life. And we've already talked about two aspects of this context, one being the uh, failure of the hierarchy, 
The second, that we may in the future have to arrange a form of uh, religion that would be uh, practiced in the home because of a coming persecution. The third aspect I'd like to look at is what has happened to our uh, civilization. Uh, many people are experiencing a loneliness and a, a sense of rootlessness. What do you think has happened to our civilization in its most important points? All right. Very good. That's a very broad canvas. Now, do you want to start off with the first point about the civilization we're living in? The condition yes. Thing? What has happened to it that people don't feel at home in it? Well, I'll tell you, Bernard, what has happened is this. It put in several simple language. It is that that which made our civilization possible has stopped, has ceased to exist. You see, whether people admit it or not, and believers do admit it, but they don't always realize it, and non-believers don't realize it at all, and they don't believe it, on this earth, everything that exists, everything that happens, everything that people do, is either on God's side or it's on the side of the devil. There is no choice. There's no in-between. There's, There's no third option. No third option. Between the supernatural and the natural, uh, and the, the purely natural, there's no option. Christ has decreed by coming on earth and becoming a man, becoming a baby, growing up, founding the church, he has decreed that the supernatural has penetrated the natural. The best illustration of that is from his own life, you know, when he met this deaf man, totally deaf man. Now, he could, in his power, have said, Here, be cured. Forget your deafness. In one stroke, by even not saying it, he could think it, he could will it. He didn't. He sat down, uh, squatted down with the man, and he spat on the ground and made a little mud pie, and he pasted his ears and said, Let your ears be opened. Why did Christ do that? Pedagogically. What, what was he teaching? He was teaching this, uh, that his power penetrated all things, all matter. The, the supernatural has penetrated this world, this cosmos, this material cosmos of sun, moon and stars and earth and trees and water and fire and all the atoms. That's all been penetrated by the supernatural. There's nothing natural any longer. By itself, it's been penetrated by the supernatural. The result is that you're either for God or against God. There's no choice. You can't. There's no thing as a neutral action. You can't act neutrally. You can't say, "Well, I, I really don't. It's not a, I have nothing against God, but I simply don't believe in it, and uh, I'm, I'm simply a, a normal human being." No, you're not. No, we're all abnormal. The, the abnormal has happened. The divine has happened to us, and nature forever is changed. Okay, number one. Number two. This is a divided nature. There is a, a personage called. Lucifer, whom we call Lucifer, or Satan, or Old Scratch, or Old Nick, whatever name we give this personage. He's an angel, and he heads legions of angels, all of whom hate us, all of whom are already in hell, all of whom are sworn enemies of Christ and of God. They have permission, a certain amount of permission, to tempt us to rule the world, uh, to govern men, to sway their minds and wills, and they do because man is supremely free. Our free will is our greatest and our most terrible gift, and they do persuade many people to follow them. The result is that uh, a civilization such as ours was built on the principle of Christ's salvation. And by the way, you know what happened? Uh, be very, be very clear mind in your mind how we did this. Remember, we were born in the middle of the, one of the greatest empires that ever existed, the Roman Empire. And until we got to the center of the empire and got power, we said, we'll have nothing to do with you. The early Christians wouldn't fight. They were killed. They wouldn't, they wouldn't join the army. They were told to by the Romans, as uh, citizens, they wouldn't. They wouldn't join. Until they got power, then they created their own army. And from about the year 400 AD to 1400 AD, 1,000 years, Christians created their new civilization out of which came everything. Came the Renaissance, and came the Enlightenment, and came science, and came uh, all, all, all modern things. The hairdos we have, the clothes we wear, the language we're speaking, the science we have, the machines we have, the light, the electricity, the automobile, the plane, everything came out of that civilization, everything, including our charity, our ch hospitals, our medicine, uh, everything came out of it. Now, that civilization is breaking up. Why? Um, it would seem that Lucifer has been given permission to break it up because men started breaking it up in the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century and according as they broke it up, God turned away and said, okay, I'll create a new one. 
But he always waits. There's always a time lag. And we're in the time lag at the present moment between one state and another state. And therefore we have, we're neither fish nor flesh nor good red herring, as they say in my native island. We're neither Christian nor unchristian. We're in transit between two points. One was the ancient civilization that's dead. It's dead. Completely dead. You have now the nations completely without God. When they gather together, they don't do that in the name of God. They don't do it. And they should. There's only one king of the universe, and that's Christ. They don't acknowledge Christ. His statue is not in the United Nations. And they don't do thing they don't do anything with his blessing. They are acting purely and simply out of self interest. And that is the fury of the nations, as the Bible calls it, which leads them to their destruction. Now we instinctively know that we're headless. We instinctively know that there's nothing really between us and all harm except the good God. That there's now no protection for us socially, politically, civilly. That we are we are exposed, naked and that we can be taken away by superior powers of state and of the world, and nobody will save us except God. We know that. Before there was a Christian civilization, a Christian king, Christian empires, Christian powers, there were powerful men socially, politically, culturally. It doesn't exist any longer. There's no such thing as Christian civilization. It's dead as a doornail. There's now this modern civilization, the glamour of it all, the richness of it all, the fecklessness of it all, the dirt of it all, the impurity of it all, and the self-satisfaction of it all. Me, 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 me. It's always me. What's good for my body? What's good for my mind? What's good for my pocket? How can I be more beautiful? How can I remain ever young? How can you help me? How can you make me better? Make me happier? Make me richer? It doesn't... There's, now, there's a lot of goodness. Traces of the old civilization. Love of neighbor and help of the sick. Protection of the weak and the helpless. There's a lot of that. That's all remnant stuff. It's not official. There's no real official charity, official love, official compassion, official purity. Come on. There's no. So our civilization, in a nutshell, is breaking down. It's broken Because down. Uh, what had built it to start with, the Christian uh, ideas, is gone. are not they're, appearing. They're gone. They're gone. They're gone. I mean, in what country in the world do Catholics, or Christians even, sway the parliaments? No. There's no place. There's no parliament really acting in Christian principles for the love of God and the kingdom of Christ. No, there isn't one. There were, originally, and not so long ago there were. That's all dead and gone. The world has turned away from God completely. And so some of these uh, symptoms, like let's say the increasing loneliness that people experience, is just a result of the breakdown of uh, Christianity. Yeah, 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 it is. But we know, we know, therefore, that the walls have been broken down in the city, and there are wild animals out there, and they're prowling, and they're devouring us. And there's no knocking, there's no... We have no, no protection. There's no protection. The very people supposed to guard us devour us. Whether it's our police, whether it's our FBI, whether it's our armies, whether it's the state, we don't know. Whether it's the corporate powers, we don't know. They're polluting our air and polluting our food and robbing our money from the, with their taxes. I mean, they, they, we're no longer protected. The, the animals are loose and we have no walls. They're within the wall. There's no walls, no gates. The city is unprotected. And we know that. And that's our, that's our loneliness. And we, 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 we don't know what to do about it. And those of us who have beliefs scan the scriptures and scan the sayings of holy men and listen to the appearances of Our Lady and ask what's going to happen, when is going to happen, is it going to happen soon, is there something going to be a change, are we going to be delivered from this, when will it be safe to walk our streets, when will it be safe again to send my children to school, when will I have really solid trust in the priest when he comes and the bishop when he comes, that the priest won't fiddle with my son and destroy his virginity or with my daughter, or the bishop will tell me the truth and not just steal my money and give me a lie. And when will the Pope give me a real direction and be a real apostle? When will that day come back again? It will come back, but not in our day. That's why we're so lonely and abandoned and lugubrious. We're not a happy, we're not a happy race uh, in any sense of the word. Um, and if, if we pretend we are, then it's simply foolishness. We're not really. Deep down, we're very unhappy people. That's the condition of the civilization we're in. And... Um, there's no movement out of that so far. There's no, no, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, Bernard. There's nothing happening that would give you the slightest idea that there's going to be an upturn. On the contrary, even the finance people, the money men, will tell you, this is a touch and a go. The market is going up, sure, but it can collapse like a balloon tomorrow, like a prick balloon, like a paper bag somebody kicks. It can go down, and the economy of the world is, is shaky, and there's too much contention. Now we have Europe 
uh, contending with uh, Russia, and we have Russia and Europe and, uh, contending with America, and then we have America contending with them and with the Asia, especially with China, with the Asian tigers and those in the, what they call the Pacific Rim. It's all contention, it's contention, contention. Gain there faster, making the bigger buck, having the bigger bang, uh, having more pleasure, having more tourism, having more bronze bodies, and having greater food supply. And meanwhile, Africa is languishing and being spoiled and polluted by us. Uh, I just saw yesterday an account of what we Shell, company Shell Oil did in Nigeria. Simply stole the oil out of the ground and polluted the land, polluted the water, and left it like that. And the Algerians are going through a terrible time with dictators now. It's, but Africa, unfortunately, now is a place that we steal things from and we dump things in and let them go to hell, literally. So the world is in a bad condition. That's where the Pope has gone. And what is it, eight times to Africa? And his cries are so, so important. He said, it was there talking once, he said, why is it, he said, that I never speak to a man over 50 in this country? They all die here. They're killed or they die. I think, I don't know if it was Zaire or someplace else, but it's a, a pathetic cry. And I have a favorite portrait of the Pope. He's sitting in the middle of a, an African village on an armchair. They brought an armchair for him with a poor little man with his wife and seven children and chickens and pigs are on the floor. And uh, there's the Pope of Rome in his white robe sitting down talking with this poor black who has nothing and whose government doesn't give a hoot about him. And what is the Pope to do? Give, give him his blessing and pray that somehow or other he'll touch the hearts of those who are raping his country of its gold and of its uh, uranium and of its coal and its lead and manganese and its silver and its diamonds but leaving the people poor, poor, poor. So we're living in a spiritual and even to a certain extent material desert. Yeah. And that leads us then to um, our next topic, which is going to be the Catholic devotional life, because that can be a source of uh, nourishment in the desert in which we live. Yeah, it is. The, well, yeah. What does the Catholic devotional life do, and what is it? Well, I'll tell you the function, well, why, why it's important even to talk. Why are we talking about it, brother? In other words, why are we devoting one whole tape to it? I'll tell you why. Um, you said, way back when we were talking there about an hour ago, you said that, uh, and we both concluded, that the aim of all these changes in the liturgy and in the Mass and in the priesthood and in churches was to destroy, to liquidate, to get rid of the Mass, get rid of priesthood. Perhaps the biggest achievement of the enemies of the Church, of Lucifer and his surrogates in this earth, is that the way they have liquidated the devotion of the Church. Let me explain what I mean by that. You see, it's Cardinal Newman, by the way, who was converted, who lived in Oxford and was an Oxford don, began very early on to say, I'm in the wrong boat. Oh, well, what about the Catholic Church? He began to have the suspicion the Catholic Church had the truth. And he started inquiring. He spent one whole summer studying it. And in that summer, towards the autumn, he started going to Mass privately, because if they saw him do that in Oxford, he'd lose his job. He'd be expelled. So he used to steal up to London. And he stole down to an immigrant church on the East End, where there were sailors and their wives and workmen and laborers, mainly Irish and Italians. And he said that he used to sit back at the back of the church and watch all these people with their children saying their rosaries, going to confession, praying to the statues, kissing the feet of the Sacred Heart, um, going to, up to Holy Communion, um, singing the hymns. And he said they all seem to be a family. They all, all seem to be gripped by the same spirit. They were all doing the same thing. And the children were perfectly at home. And, uh, and they were all set, kneeling down and saying their prayers. And he said it was like a family. And he said, I suddenly realized, he said, that this is the center, the essence of Catholicism. It's not the cool, stately singing of hymns in grand Gothic cathedrals that have no sacrament at all, and with no candles, no stations of the cross, no statues of saints, no devotion, no little children lisping their Hail Marys, and no strong men confessing their sins, and women saying their rosaries, and mass being celebrated with that fervor you only find in a Catholic church. He said, the essence was this devotion, and he said, it's the holy familiarity of Catholics with heaven. And that's the secret, and I'll tell you why. You see, from the very beginning, God made it clear, even in the Old Testament, it wasn't clear, only with Christ was it clear. He made it clear that this is a family affair. This is a family affair. There's a father and a son, and they have a family, in heaven and on earth. And the family is everything. And there's a mother now, added to it, the Blessed Virgin. 
and she's the mother of God as well as our mother. And that in a family there's great familiarity, familiaritas, and a sacred familiarity, he called it. And that familiarity allows me to talk to my guardian angels, and allows me to talk to the saints, and talk to our Lord Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, and talk to the Trinity, and greet the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Not as equals, but as my God, and as my Father, and as my Holy Spirit, and as my Saviour. And this is, this, is, this is the essence, this devotion. And when you find that that's crushed out of a parish, when they do away with the signs of devotion, which we, I want to mention in a moment, then you know that Catholicism's jugular vein has been cut. And this is where we get down to the brass text of it all. When you find that there are no stations of the cross ever, there are no novenas, there are no pray there's no prayers to the holy souls in purgatory, there's no devotion to the sacred heart, the feast days of the saints are not, are not, are not celebrated, and people don't know it, and they, they don't live those lives, and Advent doesn't mean anything, and Christmas only means gifts for the children, and a lot of turkey, and a lot of food, and a lot of, uh, of good living like that, and Lent doesn't mean anything, and Easter doesn't mean the joy it should mean. Then you know that devotion has died, and the church is dead faith is dead because that's Protestantism and it's Mormonism and it's Judaism and it's everything but Catholicism now let's stop right here so it's very important um, I'm going to give you an example and then you tell me if it's something that's happening uh, across mm -hmm. across the world in the, in the parish um, which is uh, geographically closest to where I live there was a new pastor appointed um, at the beginning of July mm -hmm. there had been uh, actually quite a few devotions there like for example there was uh, holy hours every yeah. uh, Wednesday and Friday this new priest first what he did is cancelled all the uh, Wednesday holy hours then he cancelled all but the uh, uh, first Friday of the Friday holy hours people that uh, went to them said that uh, the, the few that he held is that he would even uh, insult the people saying this is uh, uh, old stuff it's all repetition get on with it <laughs> Is this the kind of thing that that's is happening in many parishes? That's exactly what I'm talking about. There is this sudden rage. There's a rage and a fury against anything like that. Now, I, I, I spoke previously about priests I know that had to leave their, their diocese. The bishops wouldn't have them any longer. And it's all because they practiced such things. They insisted on devotions, on maintaining the feast days and sodalities and confraternities and in honor of Our Lady and the Saints and St. Joseph. And... Uh, uh, in honor of Padre Pio and in honor of Our Lady of Lourdes and statues and uh, processions all that they didn't want and uh, pilgrimages none of that that's all old stuff and to be abandoned that was the destruction they intended if these popular devotions are the essence of Catholicism then mm. we are in trouble because that's being distinct, uh, extinguished it is and it has been extinguished to a large extent they don't they don't practice it any longer that's considered to be uh, to be superstitious, to be useless, not to be modern. And I, I don't know, I go out to celebrations now with certain organizations like the Ancient Order of Hibernians, a very respectable organization. But there's no trace of devotion in it at all. No trace of devotion at all in it, in the chapters of it I've seen. And uh, it is universal too. And that's why the rosary has died out. The families no longer recite the rosary. Families are not there in the evening anyway, and when they are, they're looking at television. So it's, it's a, the essence of Catholicism is being stolen away like that. And the enemies who are within the church, who set out to destroy it, know well that if they liquidate all devotion, if they eliminate all devotion to Our Lady and St. Joseph and the Holy Souls and the saints and, their, and, and to the Blessed Sacrament, to the tabernacle, by removing the tabernacle, first of all, and then not allowing any, any devotion to it, they have, they have killed Catholicism. Then they're into a new... Uh, for instance, they're into things like... Um, they have now these uh, these new enneagrams, and they have other devotions, and the RCIA, and Renew, and all these various forms, which have nothing to do with Christian tradition, whatever. They're inventions, substitutes for devotion. Well, let's take an example of this particular parish. In the bulletins now, um, there's less and less mention of devotions, and more things like about coffee parties, and handwriting analysis, and that kind of thing. That's right. That's, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Secularization. That's what I call decatholicization. And when you find a priest doing that, when you find a priest doing that, then you either accept it and you're rid of your faith, or you revolt. You say, Father, we want it back or else we're not coming back. Now, that's the difficulty. That's the difficulty. Is these devotions a feature that's uh, distinctive of Catholicism? Yeah. Is there any other religion no. that has all that? None. None. We're the only ones who have that. 
We're the only Christian religion that has that, and no other religion has anything like it. Anything like it, whatever. It is utterly distinct. And when you find that not existing, when you find it extinguished or not there at all, you know that Catholicism cannot be alive. And then we've just become like any other religion, basically. That's right. That's right. You gather on a, on a weekday if you want to, if you feel like it, and you sing a few hymns. And, uh, and that's why, you see, the whole business of... Uh, when they wanted to promote altar girls, it wasn't so much that there's anything wrong with little girls in the altar. There's nothing wrong with it, essentially. It's just that the emphasis is laid in the wrong way. It's not, it's, not, it's not a matter of pride to be all dressed up. And By the way, the, for instance, the Bishop of uh, uh, Bishop Gracias of uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, he holds an annual uh, uh, award for the best altar girl of the year. And he has everything except a swimsuit uh, exhibition. But they do everything else that Miss America does. And the girl who is a, there's a, a, a winner and a runner-up and, and a substitute, and they, they go through the same thing as the Miss America pageant. And that has nothing to do with Christian devotion. It's merely wordliness. Now, from what you've said, it seems to me then that what the Catholic devotional life does is it builds uh, the uh, sacred into our day-to-day -day lives. That's right. That's right. It makes you familiar. It gives you, puts you on a familiar basis with the angels. And otherwise, then, it's something that's very distant. Well, nowadays, Bernard, I find when people come to see me and to come to talk about religion, about their conscience, and hear their confessions, and I clean it up, and that sort of business, the first thing I start asking them when they've done all that is, do you say a rosary? You find say, no, no. Have you got a rosary? Some of them have, some of them have, most of them haven't got. Uh, do you ever pray to your guardian angel and say, who? They don't know who the guardian angel is. They don't know they have a guardian angel. They don't know they have one. Much less pray to him. They don't know that. And then the feast day of the saints. What is, what, what is that about? Do you ever pray to a saint? Do you ever get down on your knees? Most of them never knelt in their lives, by the way. Most of them never knelt down once in their lives. In their churches, in their schools, they never kneel. They never kneel. So kneeling, adoration, worship is something they never got. So they don't know what a saint is. They don't know what to worship God is. They don't know what it is to kneel down in front of the tabernacle. They don't know what it is to pray to St. Joseph, to celebrate uh, St. Peter or St. Ignatius. They don't know what that means. So there's a total loss of knowledge. Total. There's no devotion. They never make a novena. They never say Hail Mary in honor of St. Teresa of Lisieux. They, they, that's all gone. That's all gone. That familiarity with the kingdom of heaven and its family is not there any longer. And you see, there's, that the difficulty is that the difficulty is that if you don't have that, you're not on an equal footing with the supernatural. You're not really living a life. Whereas you should be, you should know all about the nine choirs of angels, what each choir does. You should know which choir does your guardian angel belong to. You, you should pray to him uh, for that. Uh, it, it should fill your life because the angels are all around us. They, they sustain life, they sustain bridges, they sustain the bricks of this house, they sustain the city in which we are, and they keep the rivers flowing and keep the water in the ocean, and keep mountains from toppling on top of us, and keep fire from burning us. They, they, they are the, the, the pillars of creation. That's, the, that's what they were created for. So then another way to look at it is that when you live a life of the supernatural of devotion, you are experiencing really the fullness of reality. That's right. That's and right. That's right. now modern man seems to have cut himself off from the whole supernatural dimension. Complete, completely. And he has no idea that for so what's going on around him. And then they get sudden ideas about the angels. They suddenly hear about the angels. Or Michael Landon had a, had a picture, a series, uh, something about heaven. And he was an angel, actually, down on earth for punishment. And uh, it's a very popular series. He's dead now, Michael Landon. He's young. He's the man who used to act in the Ponderosa films with, with Lauren Green. But, uh, but people then got uh, all excited about angels. But it died out it wasn't founded on any belief whereas Roman Catholics have a fully fledged theology of angels and we should, ne we should neglect them we should praise them constantly because they're always with us and they will be with us from the time we're born conceived and born until we die that's the only part of it because then there are saints and then there are the vast series of devotions look, take one point which is very important I may mo meet, meet most Catholics now and I say to them have your devotion to the wounds of Jesus they say the wounds of Jesus. I say yes. First of all, they don't know how many wounds he had. So he tells them he had wounds in his right hand, in his left hand, in his right foot, in his left foot. He had a wound in his shoulder, in his right shoulder, and he had a wound all over his head because of the crown of thorns. And then he had a wound in his side where the, the soldier stuck a spear in to make sure he was dead, out of which came water and blood on the cross. 
explain all that. And then they say, well, what am I supposed to? I said, well, you're supposed to insert yourself in the wounds. You're supposed to drink his blood and be united with him. And they kind of, they, it's utterly new. They, this was never explained to them. They never heard this. And yet the protection from our Lord's wounds is capital for temptation, capital in life for getting graces, and it's capital for the presence of God. Without that, there isn't much sanctity. And there isn't one saint we know of who wasn't devoted to the wounds of our Lord. But that's devotion. And now people would laugh at you, the modern priests. A lot of them would say, come on, that's all superstition. And that means they no longer have a devotion to Christ, the person of Christ. And you see, Bernard, when you lose devotion, attachment to, and devotion to the person of Christ, physical and spiritual, his mind and his soul and his body, then you've lost your faith. You really have, then you, you're not talking about a real person. And we have a real person, a real God, who is a human person, who is a human, uh, a real person, who is human and divine. And we have that. Uh, but if we lose that, if we never had it, we're not really Catholic. We're deficient, severely deficient. And if we go along for a long time without that and have no devotion to him, we cease to be Catholic. We don't want his body and blood in the whole community. We don't believe he's there. And uh, that we lose the essence of what it is to be Christian. And we're miserable. We've lost it. We've lost it. We've lost it. That's the difficulty. So what can they offer? Nothing. There's nothing they can offer. And then the Protestants step in, and the Jewish chaplains step in, and the Baptist chaplains step in. And they have something to say. They have some devotion left. But before, um, if ever you'd suffer a reverse in your business, or there would be a death in the family, or whatever, there you was, could always fall back on your devotions. There was always devotion. There was always some saint to help you. Saint Jude, or the saint, saint Anthony, or Saint Bernard, or some. There were always the saints and the souls in purgatory. And your favorite saint. And then there were people who died, your mother and your father, and your, or brothers and sisters, or your friends, whom you could ask to intercede for you. So they, all that's gone, it's, uh, because that was deliberate, because it r destroys the essence of Catholicism and makes it a worldly organization that's a stabilizing factor socio-politically socio and socially, but is no threat to the plans of those who will dominate the minds of our young children and dominate our minds. There's no threat to them in that. Besides, you see, Satan owes his death, owes his wreckage, owes his shipwreck. He owes it to our Lord and Our Lady. The Bible says, a woman, to, her, to the devil, you will wait in time for her heel and she will walk on you. That's in Genesis 3.15. And uh, he did, and she walked on him. And she is the one we all say, uh, Rejoice, Virgin Mary, you have crushed all heresies. You have walked on the head of the serpent. So he hates her and hates all devotion to now, her. Now, I would like to... Uh pick up again a topic that earlier we had said we would discuss, and that's uh, the topic of Fatima. Uh -huh. There seems to be an especially strong opposition to the uh, message of Fatima. The Why? Because it is the best warning we have had of what's coming. Um, Our Lady did reveal in Fatima to the three children, and therefore to us, to the Pope, and to the whole Christian nation, to everybody who would listen, she did reveal that God is going to chastise the world and that it can't go on getting more and more pagan and more and more uh, uh, irreligious. And Fatima is the, is, the, is the record of that. And the third secret is the record of that. That John the Twenty-Third, good Pope John, was supposed to reveal in 1960. He, for unworthy motives, decided not to. He decided to disobey Our Lady. God help him. God help him. Because how did he face her and her son when he died? How did he explain himself? Having disobeyed them, they gave him a mandate and he refused. And it was a mandate, it was an either or mandate. Our Lady said, if this isn't done, there will be great trouble, there will be chastisements. That's either. Or either you do it or there's going to be great punishment. He didn't do it. And therefore we're in the or, as they say now, we're in the, uh, the alternative. And we're heading for trouble and chastisements. We know that now. Even the present Pope admits that. They all admit it. And Cardinal Ratzinger uh, admits it. And everybody who's read The Third Secret and who knows Lucia knows that. But at the same time, look at the power of Satan. Since then, he has successfully, through the Pope, through the Vatican, he has suppressed Sister Lucia. They've published forged letters in her name. They've made her say things she didn't want to say. They've put statements on her lips that she never made. Uh, and they have forbidden her to be seen by people. And they've forbidden uh, for parades of Our Lady of Fatima statue in various cities in the world. So when we read that 
Sister Lucy has said this and this and that. You can't necessarily believe it. Not now. Not now. We know that lies have been published in her name. And she is now, she's now in Purda, as we say in uh, India. She's now suppressed and kept utterly under wraps. Uh, and but Christ will deal with it all in his own time. But in the meantime, she's suffering because she knows the truth. She knows it's going to happen. And she's not allowed to talk about it. She's not allowed to tell people. And people are not allowed to know about it. And they're told it's all, it's all myth. And uh, it's all false. And it doesn't matter. And then the day it happens, what are they going to do? What are they going to say? What are they going to say in about three or four years' time? Who are the people that are working so hard to suppress uh, Fatima? A bunch, a whole bunch of Catholic prelates in Rome who belong to Satan, the servants of Satan, and the servants of Satan outside the church in various organizations that want to destroy the Catholicism of the church and keep it as a stabilizing factor in human affairs. It's an alliance, a dirty alliance, a filthy alliance, but it's a very good alliance. And look what it has done so far. It has suppressed all mention of Fatima, kept it out of the news. It, anything like anything about the other big revelations like Garabandal, or Akita in Japan, or Batania in Venezuela, or uh, Naju in South Korea. Who knows about them any longer? And these are marvelous revelations of God's goodness, and of Christ's will, and of the coming chastisement. And it's so hard to get the news through because the church will not publish it. And it seems like any priest that tries to promote it runs into all kinds of opposition. He's fired. He's fired. Some of the 42 priests I was telling you about that are now, I'm trying to help, were those who promoted these things and they were called by the bishop who said, either stop this or next month they'd be gone. And they were gone. They were gone. So, there is this animus. And of course, Bernard, let's be awfully frank. The devil, Satan, hates but he must hate the mother and the child more than anything in the wide world. Because that was his undoing. They are his undoing. And he can't be reconciled with them. He can never be in heaven with them. He never saw them in heaven. He has been condemned and he's lost. And he wants to take as many people with him as he can. And he's an angel. And he's totally dependent on Christ. Because he only knows what Christ allows him to know. And he does what allows Christ allows him to do. Uh, so he hates them and the mark of Satan is hate and lie and killing, murder as Jesus said, you know he was, imagine Christ, the gentle Christ I mean the way he described uh, Satan was very pithy he said from the beginning he was a liar and a murderer that's what he called uh, Judas, I mean uh, Satan he's a liar and a murderer and he said I saw him fall from heaven like sheet lightning he fell as fast as that once he disobeyed, he went straight to hell like sheet lightning from one end of the car. The, the way lightning sweeps across suddenly in, 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 a, in a nanosecond across the horizon. As fast as that he fell. He didn't got, he hadn't got time to put on his cap, as they say. He fell. And therefore he hates. And you see, what must increase his hate is this. We must remember this about Satan. He never saw God. He was never in heaven. He was like Adam. He was given a great being and given great pleasure and power and told, don't do certain things and do certain things. Like Adam. But he never saw God, no more than Adam did. Because if he saw God once, he'd be in heaven. So he was tested and he failed the test. And he fell like sheet lightning from the east to the west, as Christ describes this fall. He said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning from east to west. That was Christ's vivid image. And boy, was he an orator. I mean, if, you know, if you've ever seen sheet lightning go as fast as that, you know how fast that is. That's how long it took for God to dispose of this rebellious angel. As fast as that. Once he made a, a major error. Now, therefore he has this frustration. He was within touching distance of divinity. And he was so ambitious. And he was so beautiful and so brilliant. He was the most brilliant and intelligent of all God's creatures. And he failed through pride and vanity. And now he will never, never seek God. He doesn't know what he's like. He doesn't know what he's like. He never saw an angel in his glory. He never saw anything. He's a poor, twisted bit of uh, angelic trash. So now this leads us now to another point, that what we're experiencing, um, which we have experienced from be the beginning of time, is a spiritual battle, and devotions are our weapon protect us in this battle. That's right, they are. They're, they're, the, they're the things that give us the, the juice, they give us the armor, they give us the sword, they give us strength. And uh, if you ever, uh, as Catholics have found this out, and if you, uh, I'm sure you've found it out, if you want to resist temptation, there's only things, the only thing that helps you is devotion. 
call on the angels and saints and call on our Lord. Because you can't resist temptation. Whether it's sex or money or power or what? Or anger or whatever you're tempted by. You can't, you can't overcome it except by devotion. And there's, there's another thing to it too. And it's this. On earth, as we are now, we are supposed to be already participating in heaven's life. Now supposing you are in the state of grace, supposing you do go to communion and you do go to confession and you do go to mass and you keep the law and you keep yourself clean from sin and when you sin you go to confession etc. You still would not be living the full life of the Trinity unless you're talking to the angels, unless you're talking to the saints by devotions and talking to Our Lady saying a rosary. You're not living a full life. You're not living the life of the Trinity. And you're not just speaking to the Holy Ghost. You're not keeping them company. That's our life. Even on earth, we're already participating. We are members of that. We're already in heaven in that sense. All that happens in, in death is that if we can go to heaven straight away, God removes the veil and then we're fully fledged members of the family enjoying everything they enjoy. If not, we've got to go to purgatory. But even there, we know we belong. We're part of the family. Now, you've talked about removing the veil. So what the devotions also help us to do is to see... Um, the truth and reality more clearly. That's right to do. They, 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 make, they make me think. They, they make me realize what the angels are for. They make me think what he suffered in his passion. And uh, if you were to go through, say, the chaplet of St. Michael, uh, through each of the, the, the nine versions in honor of the, uh, the, of the angels, and follow what they mean and find out what, what an angel is, and pray to him for that reason, pray to him for his qualities, the enlightenment that comes from that about the Trinity and about sin and about yourself and about consolation and solutions for your everyday problems, by the way, come like that. Because then you become part and parcel of them and you become a willing recipient of heaven's direction. And that's what we're supposed to do long before we die. Long before we die, we're supposed to be like that. We're supposed to live that life. Instead of living a barren life, uh, reciting a certain amount of hymns, standing to attention and uh, fulfilling certain uh, financial obligations which is not Christianity at all and uh, then for instance there is no way I know of how you can make be fervent in your devotion to the Blessed Sacrament how you can receive the Blessed Sacrament in Holy Communion receive that worthily unless you have devotion there's no way because you can't be cold about it you are getting the body and blood of our Lord what does that, what does that mean? how are you going to appreciate that? not with reason no, but you, you can't reason yourself into that. That's devotion. That's devotion. And only the angels and saints and Our Lady will teach you that devotion. They're the only ones who will. Now, there's a statement that you've made a while ago in a private conversation that really has uh, stuck in my mind ever since. And that oh. was that when you were uh, in training in the Louvain mm -hmm. um, in Belgium, mm -hmm. there already was some modernism uh, sure. there in the 1950s. Sure there and you said there were two characteristics of uh, some of these modernist professors that were there. And that is that they were all highly intelligent men, and secondly, they had no prayer life whatsoever. None. None. No devotion at all. And they would mock, and not mock gently usually, but they would mock those who were very devoted. And actually, it was a mixed and gathering of the nations. We had people from everywhere, from east, west, north, and south. We had Orientals and Occidentals. We had South Americans and North Americans. We had Europeans of every type, brand, and description. And blacks from Africa. Huge people from Rwanda were in these huge uh, uh, Hutu, I think they're called, or Watutsis. They're enormous and big men. And we had small little pygmy men, too, priests too, studying, all studying. We were all postdoctoral studies. And um, uh, what I noticed was that, it's amazing, that uh, the modernists had no devotion at all. And the Latin Americans and the blacks uh, from Africa and the Asiatics and the Irish couldn't understand this. And the Spaniards and the Italians either they couldn't understand it. Why couldn't God devotion to the best virtue to the saints? They'd laugh at that. They consider all that childish and superstitious. And they were the men who later became very prominent as heretics and as uh, liberation theologians and as rebels against Rome and rebels against dogma. They were typical of that. Then if you took a man like, for instance, like Karl Rahner, the big theologian, I'm sure you've heard his name. Mm -hmm. uh, Karl had about as, as much devotion now as my boot. He had no devotion at all. None at all. He was a cold, rational Austrian who had rationalized everything and gave so much misdirection and indirection to people. He corrupted people's lives so easily. And he was, an, he was a heresiarch, not recognized as such in his lifetime. But the typical, the, 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 the 
the, 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 the quality of the, the, the mark of him was a total lack of devotion. He had no devotion, what, no real devotion, whatever, at all. And those who hadn't, we always found they were rationalists about everything. And their subsequent lives turned out like that too. They were useless as priests. They were just ambitious. Some of them left the church, some of them didn't, some of them stayed, some of them went. But it, it, was, it was quite clear that they had no devotion and didn't want to have any devotion. Now, how do devotions come into being? Does a committee sit down and strike them up? No, no, no. The Holy Ghost starts it. The Holy Ghost, uh, our Lord appears to Catherine Laburian, starts the, uh, a lady does, and starts the miraculous medal. Uh, he, our Lord appears to, uh, to Margaret Mary Alacock, a nun in a convent, and says, I want devotion to my sacred heart to be established, and so on and so forth. And our lady appears in Fatima and says, I want renewed devotion to the rosary. And to the nine, to the nine, to the first Saturdays. No, they started by the angels and saints, and by Christ Himself, and by Our Lady. Started like that. They never start. They don't start spontaneously. Our committee doesn't sit down and say, "Okay, now let's devise a new devotion." That doesn't take place like that. It's always under the impulse of the Holy Ghost. Now, intelligent observers of uh, Catholicism, and let's say one example is uh, the late uh, Sir Kenneth Clark in England, uh -huh, uh -huh. have observed that. Catholicism's uh, devotions, um, from a, just a purely psychological point of view, contain an infinite amount of uh, wisdom and good common they sense. Do. They do. They do. And it seems like there's, uh, for every possible uh, problem or situation, there is a devotion. There's nothing uh, left uncovered. Nothing. There's nothing left uncovered. He, he's quite right. There are these psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, and I've worked with many of them in, here in New York, they all insist on devotion for their people, and they insist on confession for their, for their clients. They say, I can't heal you unless you go to confession, unless you say a rosary, unless you have devotion to the saints. And they all, by the way, we find that people have gone through trauma. I was talking to a young lady, for instance, who has been raped and had an abortion with a child and gone through all that awful misery. The only, finally, healing has come from confession and the rosary, devotion to Our Lady, she's turned over a new leaf in her life, and she's, she's, she's able to face life before she was suicidal. So, yes, it has a big, deep psychological effect. Uh, in fact, a lot of psychiatrists will recommend the rosary, even though they don't believe in it, because they say the repetition is tr and, the, and the thoughts are calming and soothing, and it's true, they have that effect. But what really happens is people get very close to God and Our Lady. That's what really happens. Now, we have... Uh discussed about the apostasy that is occurring within the church. Yes. How is a family to uh, practice their devotions? Because it doesn't seem that uh, the parish is really giving them any direction. There's where there's a new... Uh, that's, that, that is the big thing that I drum home to people, and we must all drum home to everybody, is this, that today all the safety nets are gone. When I was young, Bernard, there were safety nets all... It was very hard to go wrong, because there was always somebody to catch you from falling. Either your parents, or the teachers, or the cops, the local cop, who knew everybody, or uh, my companions, or the families of my companions, and then there was the community. There's no such thing today. And therefore, and by the way, the worst thing is then, my, my children have got to go to school, and my children have got to go and, uh, to dances and proms, and mix in with people at the, at the local uh, gallery, or the local whatever it is, where they have all these games. And um, I, if I don't have the family rosary, if we don't have the family going to Mass together and going to confession together, if we don't have prayers together, then there's not going to be any life. In, there's not going to be any devotional life. And they will lose it. If they don't learn it from you, they'll never learn it from anybody. They'll never learn it again. Uh, ever. If, they, if you don't do it. So, so the you, prayer life has to be practiced in the family now yeah, at home. It's now the obligation of the father and the mother. It wasn't before. They can be blasé about it because the nuns did it and the teachers did it and uh, other families did it and it was common in the parish. There was a parish. Nowadays parishes are not for that. Parishes are there for collections and parishes are there for uh, other social movements but not for devotion. They don't practice devotion at all. They does not practice. So the parents must do it. And if any parents are saying, well, my children, they're really not very religious, I always turn them and say, that's your fault. That is only your fault now. Because the children are not going to get it anywhere. You have to give it to them. If you're not giving it to them, you're falling down in your, in your, in your, in your, in your duty. And it's true. But so the, the position of a parent now is totally different from what it was in my day. There are no more safety nets. And if they don't do that... And by the way, no parent can say they don't know what to do. They can find out very easily. It's awfully easy. There's so many helps nowadays, this year, 1995. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, no. We were all caught unawares. 
Now it's different. You can find out everything you need about homeschooling, about home prayers, about uh, education of children in religion. But it's all written up and all studied by very zealous people. They'll come to your house and explain it to you. There's, there's, there's a whole service in that regard, if you want to find out, if you want to find out. But it takes a special effort. And the only thing I, I would say to parents, and we should all say to parents, is that if you don't do it, nobody will. And if nobody does it, and you don't do it, you're going to be blamed for it. Because you're their parents. It happened in your watch. It's your fault. The child can always turn on you in eternity and say, you didn't teach me this. So what would you recommend then to parents who don't really know how to go about uh, setting up a uh, program of devotions for their family? They've got to find out from somebody who does. They've got to contact people, find out, write to some... That always means if you read some Catholic newspapers, you'll find names and dates and places and addresses and telephone numbers. You can do it. And then it's very hard in the normal... You, cities of Canada and the United States not to be able to find the right type of Catholics. You'll find them if you want to search. You'll find them. They're there. And you're educated enough to be able to do that. You're not complete. You're not a complete primitive. You can read and you can call telephone. You can travel. You can ask questions. You can find out if you want to find them. But you must want to. Because nobody's going to say to you in the future, do it. Nobody's going to correct you. The child above all won't do it. But the child is glad to be free of any constraint. Uh, so you, unless you do it, nobody will do it, and unless you do it willingly, you're not going to do it at all. So you have to you have to apply your mind to it. That's the terrible obligation of parents nowadays. They have this dreadful obligation that parents before hadn't got. They had an obligation, but nothing as strenuous as they have now, because the outside influences are very very bad on the child, so that. Uh, the parent has this uh, terrible obligation, but cannot say, I didn't know what to do. Oh, yes, you did. Yeah, at least you could have, if you had searched. Yes, you knew. You could have known what to do. You could have known what to do. And they always end up, I, at the receiving end in confession, they end up saying, yeah, I should have known. I, I knew really. I knew I could find it, but I was too lazy. I was, I was too distracted. And myself and the wife were having a good time. Or, you know, my husband and I, we were thinking about, we used to go to the Cayman Islands, we used to go to Virginia Island, we used to go to this and that. We hadn't the time. We didn't think. And the children went off in their own way. Now, are there any general principles that you would recommend for families who are setting up a plan of devotions? Yes, there are. First of all, they've got to decide about the Mass. They've got to decide where they go to Mass, who's their priest? Who do they go to confession to? That's the first thing to decide. Where they go to Mass. And they've got to find out, is the Mass valid? Is it a valid Mass? Is it a real Mass or is it, is it a fake? Uh, and they've got to find that out. And they can find that out by searching. Again, nobody can give the answer. Because nobody knows their priest or where they are. Uh, so they've got to find out themselves. The first thing to find out is that. Secondly, they've got to find out uh, how, depending on how old the children are, what's the damage? What's the damage really done to the children? Um, are they really damaged? And um, uh, what age are they? If I, have a, if I have a boy of 16 that can't say they are father, there's damage. And if I have a daughter or a son, for that matter, of 12 who doesn't know anything about God or Jesus or Nazareth or the Passion or the Crucifixion or anything, uh, doesn't know the prayers, doesn't say prayers at night, and has no, has no, has no knowledge of it, and then I have a problem. I have a problem. I really have a problem. I, I'm, I'm at fault. I'm at fault. And so on and so forth. And if I have, above all, if I have grandchildren coming from my and it, the, the wave of paganism has reached down that yet, I have a lot of responsibilities, and I'm responsible. I am responsible. So the first thing is to find out about your own family. That's the first thing. Check on it all. They must, you, you can't let it go, you can't, there's no such a laissez-faire, you don't let it go. You are responsible and you will be held responsible by Christ. He will ask you, why did you do this? There were your children. You had time, from the time they were yay high, you could have influenced them. You didn't. You were having beer with the boys and you were having a good time with your wife. And you didn't want to bother about you were too lazy. Or you said you were too tired. You weren't too tired to play cards, or you weren't too tired to go up and have beer with the boys. You weren't too tired to have that affair with that woman the night after work before you came home. Or this affair with boys because you were a pedophiliac. So he catch you at every hand's turn. So the first thing is to find out about your mass, your priest, and where you go to mass. And then secondly about your children. What's their condition if you have children? Or your wife? What's the, what's the relationship? Is it purely, purely self-advantage? Is there any, do you do any good, you two? Uh, but then, as far as devotions, you, you want to find some good priest who will instruct you if you don't know the devotions. You find a good priest who will. And there are good priests still. There are people, and there are then organizations of good Catholics who are very fervent and keen. And you can find through them, you can find an awful lot. If you search. I find, too, that there's uh, 
two great things that are really helpful in setting up a plan of devotions. And one of them is that uh, in any uh, traditional Roman Missal, they have, almost in every case, um, a relatively long list of prayers that you can use to sure. get started. Sure that. The other uh, great thing is that there seems to be almost an infinite variety of uh, prayers and devotions available so that one can vary them uh, throughout the yeah. seasons yeah, and by day by day. You need never say the same prayer twice for about ten years. Really, there are so many prayers, so many options. You can be really variegated. Uh, different. But you see, um, uh, Bernard, in order to do that, you have to believe in eternity. You have to know that you're going to eternity. You have to believe in God. You have to be an adult and know that now this is no rehearsal. This is it. You'll never have this life again. It's all over after this. See, for a long time when I was young, I'm sure everybody else, you think that life is infinite. I mean, when you're 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, you still think that life is, is open to everything. You know, that it's not. It's, it's closing in slowly but surely around you. And by the time you come to the age of 50, 55, 60, you know those walls are towering over and closing in on you. By the time you get 70 or 75 or 76, you know you're hemmed in in a small alleyway and there's no exit except that way. You can't turn back. And then you know it's no rehearsal. You know then that anything you do now is unrepeatable. You can't get back to that and recorrect it, redress it. You must do as well as you can do it, do it now because you won't be able to go back. It's, there's no, there's no rehearsal. This is, this is it. This is your only chance. And um, that takes adult thinking. And we don't want to think like that. Because that's a dreadful option for us. So we, we're, we're inclined to be very difficult to get to in that sense. So we must be very careful to lay our foundation of devotions very, very strongly. And because if we do, we'll nourish our life on earth. And we'll begin to live, live the life we will live in heaven. That's the principle. So... The principle is that one must put eternal things uh, first. That's right. And then the devotions will uh, follow naturally. They'll follow naturally. And, you, and you've got to make an effort. Nobody's going nobody's to do it nowadays. There is no church devotion any longer. The priests and the bishops are not pushing this any longer. They have lost devotion. You have to find out yourself. Go find out because God will say, why didn't you? Thank you, Father Martin, for participating in these three interviews. It's been uh, something quite uh, distinct.